All right. Welcome to the 2022 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum. I'm Dan Brissett with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and it's really nice to see everybody in person. This is the first in-person panel that we've done since February 2020, uh, and um, it's really nice to be back up here on the Hill. A um, couple quick things before we get into the panel. Um, the first is uh, there's a lot of materials out on the front desk, including speaker bios and things like that. We're going to move pretty quickly, so if you'd like to learn more about our speakers or any of the topics, check out the desk. Uh, you can also visit us online at www.eesi.org. Also encourage everyone, we want you to pay attention to our speakers, but we also encourage you to take part in the online conversation on social media. You can follow us on Twitter at EESI online. You can send us emails at ask at EESI.org. Uh, we have four fabulous panelists, and they will be, uh, we have a quick schedule adjustment, but for the most part, we're going to have a great discussion. And if you have questions in the audience today, the in-person audience, we're in the Dirksen Senate office building for the panel itself, there are some index cards, and you can make them available to my colleague Savannah up here. There are some pens as well. Just make sure you get your, uh, your questions uh, in the next 20 or so minutes over to Savannah. If you're in our online audience, um, you can follow us on Twitter at ESI Online. You can send us an email, ask at EESI.org. That's A-S-K at EESI.org. And send in your questions that way, and they'll come in and we'll feed them into the conversation. So today is a four-part panel. Um, this year is our, our policy forum. We're going to be focusing a lot on the infrastructure bill, Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Uh, it was signed into law last November, passed Congress on a bipartisan basis. This panel is going to be talking about energy system modernization. Our second panel at 2 o'clock is going to be about buildings and workforce. Our panel at 3 o'clock is going to be about the transportation investments provided by IJA, And then our 4 o'clock panel is going to be looking at energy security and national security and some of the impl implications of the infrastructure bill for that. So we have a lot. And in between our panels, we have special guests joining us by pre-recorded video remarks. Uh, our honorary co-chairs, Senators Reed Crapo, Van Hollen, and Representative Kind uh, will be joining us uh, on the video screen. So without any further ado, let's kick off our first panel. We're going to make a quick scheduling adjustment. My friend Kelly has to have a 1.30 and so we're going to let her go first, and I'm going to ask her some follow-up questions. And then we'll proceed with the rest of the panel. We'll hear from Malcolm, Joy, and Bill. So sorry about the schedule adjustment, but Kelly, it's so nice to see you in person. You too. It's, uh, I'm really looking forward to your remarks today. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you, and I'll turn my mic off. Thanks, Dan. Um, and, and thank you uh, to my fellow panelists for your flexibility. I'm so sorry that I, I have to hop off. Um, and thanks for inviting me to your very first since February 2020. I think um, I might have been here in 2020 with you. Could have been at yeah. the business council. Yeah, yeah. Um, at any rate, I'm uh, really excited to share with you all some of the important work the Department of Energy is doing to uh, implement the President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, we call it Bill inside of uh, DOE. We um, really recognize our critical role in uh, the Biden-Harris's climate agenda, which is charged with delivering transformative benefits to American families, workers, businesses, and communities. So um, through the bill, or through the bipartisan infrastructure law, President Biden has invested $62 billion in the Department of Energy. That's uh, with, a, with a B. It's, it's a lot. Um, it's the greatest climate investment as we see it in our nation's history. It's also the biggest investment to the department since our founding. Um, it stands up 60 entirely new programs, and it expands 12 existing ones. Uh, put in another way, in the next five years, uh, we're going to have we're going to have more than triple our annual funding for energy-related programs. Um, it's once in a gen generation uh, opportunity to invest in our nation's infrastructure. Uh, and it goes way beyond R&D, uh, which is a theme that you'll hear from the Department of Energy um, if you haven't already. What this is doing, it's creating really good paying jobs. It's combating climate change, of course. Uh, and it's going to grow the economy sustainably and equitably for decades to come as we see it. It is so big that we are literally restructuring the department uh, around it with a brand new energy uh, undersecretary for uh, infrastructure. Um, we got to work implementing right away. Uh, in the first couple of months, we opened a joint DO, uh, DOE and Department of Transportation office for EV charging infrastructure. We launched a new Office of Clean Energy Depl 
uh, demonstrations. We kicked off our Building a Better Grid initiative, which is aimed at, um, at, at engaging stakeholders around the build up of build out of new transmission lines. And we began recruiting 1,000 new staffers uh, to form our Clean Energy Corps to help manage all this work. And for those of you in federal government, you know what a feat that is. Um, progress so far. We, uh, uh, we did establish that Office of Infrastructure, uh, which manages, uh, for the most part, six, uh, somewhere around $50 billion. We have about $16 billion that is managed out of the EERE office, which I lead. Um, and our focus really is on expanding and improving and securing the nation's electricity grid, enhancing clean energy manufacturing supply chains, uh, doing the research, development, and demonstrations for hydrogen, carbon capture, energy storage, and EV supply chains, uh, and doing, having greater collaboration with our stakeholders, with federal agencies, with state and local governments, with nonprofits and tribal nations. In the nine months uh, since the bill passed, we have uh, made substantial progress, in my uh, opinion, on soliciting feedback from stakeholders. That's one thing you'll see about the way we do our business these days, is really making sure that it is um, locally placed uh, information to draw for, to to build out our uh, programs. Uh, we have set the stage for a number of programs based on that input that we've had, and we've already made available about thirteen billion dollars worth of uh, bill funding. With more to come this summer and this fall. So, of the sixty new DOE programs. Almost half of those have already issued requests for information, which have again yielded thousands of pages of feedback. So we can program, we can design these programs over the next five years, uh, all the all the more effectively. There's more funding coming out of DOE right now than ever before, uh, and I I think I speak for all of my colleagues when I say just how excited we are to uh, to uh, help Americans reap the benefits of these resources. Um, you can visit the DOE bill webpage. Uh, it's uh, energy.gov slash BIL, um, where you can track the newest announcements and such. But uh, I do want to give a couple of examples, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, of, of some of the programs that we're working on. In the in, uh, EERE, we have three pillars. We've got the renewable power, we've got efficiency, and we've got sustainable transportation. So in the renewable power one, we launched in May the interconnection uh, uh, Innovation Exchange, or I2X, which is a new pr uh, partnership that was funded through Bill, um, focused on grid operators, utilities, state and tribal governments, clean energy developers, and energy justice organizations, other stakeholders as well. But uh, really, this is to connect uh, more to, to connect more clean energy to America's power grid by solving challenges facing the power industry. That includes a lack of data. A short of shortage of human resources and more complicated uh, grid impact assessments. Uh, that's what this I2X program is is laid out to do. Uh, modernizing this grid is going to help us to address not only the technical challenges but also the community challenges around transportation build out around. Uh, making sure that we have resilience with the onset of more and more renewable power, of making sure that we're doing this as efficiently and effectively as possible. Um, we, um, I, I think that's all I'll say about that one. On the sustainable transportation mode, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier the Joint Office of Department, Department of Transportation with DOE, um, but also last month we, we released a notice of intent to fund an uh, $8 billion program to develop regional clean hydrogen hubs, or H2 hubs, across America. These hubs are going to create a network of hydrogen producers, consumers, and local connective infrastructure to be able to accelerate the use of hydrogen as a clean energy character and carrier and, and really to, um, to, to uh, establish market uplift for this. Um, the production, the processing, the delivery of storage uh, and storage of the uh, clean hydrogen, including innovative issues, uh, uses in the industrial sector, is really cr critical for uh, DOE's strategy to achieve the goal of a 100 percent clean grid by 2035 and net zero carbon emissions economy-wide by 2050. And my last example, and then I'll stop, is just last week that uh, the Department announced our intent to provide $225 million 
uh, to State and local governments to expand the implementation of the latest building energy codes. And that is not just standard building energy codes. We are talking about net zero codes. We are talking about stretch codes. We are talking about building performance standards. So really going forward in uh, leaning forward into the decarbonization of buildings as a, as a key strategy. And so that is just those are a few examples. I appreciate your time. And I uh, will see the floor. Thanks, Kelly. That is great. I really appreciate that. I love building codes. So it is always a great place to end. Um, I have a question for you. Um, and this is a question that I'm also going to ask our panelists a little bit later, but I'd like to get your perspective on it. And that is, what is your from where you sit at EERE, what's your vision for the energy system of 2030, right? We talk about 2030 in the context of goals and emissions reductions, but what's your vision for the energy system? And, and where do we have the most catching up to do in order for us to realize your vision for the energy system? Oh, my God. I said I had to leave at 1.30. <laughs> Um, vision for 2030. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take it out even a little bit further because just so you all understand um, where I'm coming from, the urgency of our work, 2030 is only eight years and there's a lot to do to uh, decarbonize our economy by 2050. Uh, so tw a few 2030 goals that we have, like for example, we're looking at 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. That's going to take a lot of work, and we're starting it now, a whole of government approach. Um, but I'll step back out into what the President laid out for the vision um, and, and how DOE and EERE will be contributing in that we see a fully clean grid by 2035. Uh, we've already built our strategies out for how we'll get there with solar and wind, but not just those, also with energy storage, with uh, uh, geothermal uh, at scale. Um, with a number of, of different technologies and, and also modernizing transmission. Um, out to 20, 2050, I would say our goals and the vision is a decarbonized economy, and that's across the five sectors that are the biggest contributors. So the grid by 2035, um, industry, uh, especially those hard to decarbonize industries that you can't electrify everything. You've got to think of biofuels and all the technologies and energy efficiency and carbon capture use and storage. Um, the, the third is decarbonization of our transportation sector. Uh, and that's not just cars, it's uh, road, rail, sea, and air, uh, including heavy, uh, heavy, uh, uh, heavy duty trucks for long distance, which will need hydrogen. Um, uh, the fourth would be decarbonization of our buildings. Uh, using building codes as a baseline and then, and, then, and then building other technologies and grid interactivity into that. And I would say the fifth is decarbonization of our agricultural sector. And we work very closely with the U.S. Department of Agriculture on how we can do that, not just with, uh, you know, uh, electrifying some of the, the um, uh, farm equipment, but also how can we help them to do things more efficiently? How can we coordinate and cooperate? For example, I was just out in... Um, was just out in Colorado visiting an agrivoltaic farm, which was super cool. And the lettuce was like huge and really good. <laughs> um, but you know, how do we how do we combine um, for the betterment of these farmers how they can use their agriculture and have solar and make more money and and actually be able to sustain their farms? How do we help people in the end? I think um, so. That's kind of the vision: is like getting ourselves decarbonized, but doing it in a way that's going to be impactful for people. So one, th so as we're thinking about realizing that vision, if you could isolate maybe one or two folks, one or two examples of our audience of where we have the most catching up to do. Would you say it's industry? Is it agriculture? Where should we be really focusing our resources to really make the, make the big difference soonest? Oh, gosh. The, well, the good news here is that there are, the technologies that are required are Many of them are here in hand. Many of the technologies that we have um, already, solar, wind, are, are cost competitive and able to be deployed. And that's why the, the Department of Energy has, has expanded its work to, to not only include early R&D, but how do we b develop programs that will help the market to uplift and help others to be able to deploy. So we have programs like the I2X program. We have the solar app where we've taken, for example, um, for residential uh, applications for, for um, permitting, down from about 12 days to get a permit to instant. It's zero. 
so we can get that much solar on the grid that much faster. Things that impact the way that we go about our everyday business at the local level are really, I think, where we can get the biggest bang for our buck as we're continuing to work on some of the earlier R&D technologies like perovskites, for example. Well, thank you, Kelly. And um, I, we understand that you have another commitment, so we'll excuse you to your thank rest you. of your business of Appreciate getting us on track for clean energy 2030, Lots 2035, 2050. Thank you so much. You. Uh, it's great to see you, and um, good luck. Appreciate it. Thank you. Call me in Annapolis. So that brings us to our second panelist. Uh, this is Malcolm Wolf, President and CEO of the National Hydropower Association. Malcolm, it's great to see you. There we go. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Dan, thanks for uh, inviting me. Pleasure to be here with uh, my fellow panelists. Um, and I really love the focus of, uh, of this year's session on infrastructure. Um, it obviously, uh, the, uh, the big legislation last year is, is transformative and it fits well with uh, the priorities for the National Hydropower Association. We really think of hydropower, uh, and just uh, let me step back, um, I'm, uh, the National Hydropower Association represents all forms of water power. So it's traditional hydropower, run of river, pump storage, wave energy, tidal energy, all sorts of really cool marine energy technologies as well. Um, and we really see them as forever assets, forever infrastructure. These, when you build these facilities, they don't last 10 years or 20 years. Um, I have visited uh, probably a dozen facilities that were built 100 years ago and are still providing reliable, clean power now, which is amazing. I mean, some of these facilities were built by Thomas Edison, um, and they're still generating cost effectively today. So, um, so it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing resource. Um, I want to leave you, since I know I only have five minutes, with two, two takeaways. Here are my two takeaways. Um, first, hydropower and pump storage are an essential part of a reliable, clean energy grid, even though it's often overlooked. Uh, and my second takeaway is that uh, we really need parity and federal support. Otherwise, uh, the technology is gonna, that we're taking for granted now is going to disappear. So let me dive into each of those two real quickly. Um, hydropower is an essential part of a reliable clean energy grid. It's, um, right now, it's a dispatchable clean energy resource. We provide power to about 30 million Americans. Um, overall, it's about 7% of U.S. electricity generation, but almost 40% of U.S. renewable power generation. So 40% um, of renewable power generation, but I'm going to have to, I was tempted to kick Kelly under the table as she was speaking about uh, her vision for 2030. Um, you know, she mentioned, um, I think she mentioned almost every technology, uh, geothermal and, and others, and, and overlooked hydropower, even though I was sitting right next to her. So um, that's one of our challenges, is we're just taking for granted. Most of the modeling that you see just assumes that the hydropower that's there is going to continue. Um, and unfortunately, that's not, that's not the case. Um, let me uh, share just three reasons why I think we're essential. First of all, it's about 100 gigawatts of clean, dispatch, largely dispatchable power, 80 gigawatts of traditional uh, hydropower, uh, and over 20 gigawatts of pump storage. Um, so secondly, we view it as a force multiplier, particularly as the grid gets uh, increasing amounts of variable resources, wind, solar, et cetera. Uh, you need to firm up those resources for when, you know, the sun goes down almost every night, right? So um, you know, in the evening, we're going to need to have um, um, power. Uh, batteries, fantastic technology, love them. I'm an EV enthusiast. Um, but they're really cost effective at under four hours. You know, there are times when you need long duration energy storage. It may be um, overcast for several days or a week. Um, and you need long duration energy storage. Uh, pump storage provides uh, over 90% of the US electricity storage, which is a giant water battery. And yet we're largely overlooked. So we really do view it as essential to a reliable system and a cleaner system. Uh, and we overlook it to our peril, which is my second point. Um, we really need parity in, in federal support and a couple, a couple ways. Um, first of all, the number of voluntary license surrenders um, has been increasing. Most of these facilities, fortunately, have been small. But in the, in the 2010s, we had 41 facilities choose to voluntarily surrender their license. They get these licenses for 50 years. When they're, you know, once you have them, they're, they're you know, producing power. The water doesn't cost anything. So it's relatively easy to keep them operating. 
um, to give up your license once it's already built is a really big deal. We had 41 facilities give it up in the 2010s. We've had another 17 in just the last two years. So something is happening. The economics are changing. The cost of license renewals are um, just not, the industry is not willing to do it. Um, which becomes really dangerous when you realize that half the non-federal fleet is up for relicensing by 2035, which feels like a long way away, except the licensing process often takes that long. Um, on average, it's eight years, um, with many facilities taking well over a decade. So the wave of relicensing in this nation is starting now, and the economics are such that every other technology is getting, is getting some form of support, and it's very difficult to get financing to go through the uncertain relicensing process. So the specific things we've done, we've worked with the um, environmental community and the tribal community. Um, American Rivers and a number of tribes around the country, uh, we've put together an uncommon dialogue. It's taken us years, but we've jointly put together a, what we hope is a bipartisan package for support on the federal tax side, as well as license reform support. And uh, those two issues, kind of parity on the federal support on the tax side and reform of the licensing form would make a huge difference for, for the industry. So I will wrap it up there and look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Malcolm. Really appreciate that. Our next panelist is Joy Ditto. Joy is President and Chief Executive Officer of American Public Power Association. Hi, Joy. Hi, thank you, Dan, for having me, and um, thanks for uh, having this, hosting this in person again after, after several years. Um, so I, I will start by saying, so we're, I'm the uh, only panelist representing actual utilities um, in this group, and as opposed to sort of resources or the federal government. So I bring a, a perspective, but certainly support everything Malcolm already said about hydropower. It's a, it's a key part of our um, mix in public power. So what is public power? Uh, public power is not-for-profit, community-owned utilities that are, um, have been around in many cases over 100 years as well. Uh, they are in 49 states, all but Hawaii, unfortunately, five territories, and there are 2,000 publicly-owned utilities nationwide. So it's, again, publicly-owned, not-for-profit. Uh, many of those are very small utilities with in communities of 10,000 people or fewer, uh, but many are also, we have a, a handful of very large cities such as San Antonio, Austin, Los Angeles, Sacramento. So really, we, we came into being many years ago when the private sector was unwilling or unable to provide communities electric service when those communities wanted it, very similar to what we, we see in broadband today. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's more expensive to produce infrastructure in smaller density areas or in small communities, and the profit wasn't there initially. We are about 15% of the mix now, uh, current times, and that means we provide electricity to 50 million, five zero million Americans. Uh, last time I checked, the entire country of Canada was about 37 million people, so we're still a pretty significant part of the mix. So in terms of, I'm going to focus my remarks on the IIJA, and I'm sorry, I know that wasn't what Kelly mentioned it, the, the BIL, I think, is what she said, but we call it the IIJA still. Um, so, you know, the IIJA is a huge opportunity for public power, and I would venture to say the entire sector, and would really uh, agree with Kelly's remarks, the Assistant Secretary's remarks about that, and glad to, you know, we know that DOE has really been staffing up and creating a different structure to help get these funds out the door, create some of these new programs. Um, but it really does help public power utilities, small, many, in many cases, very small electric utilities that sometimes only have 10 employees or fewer um, working on these things to really build on um, what they've already done and to meet these clean energy needs and to address climate change. And um, there is, however, you know, some concern over some of these, with some of these smaller entities about how they may manage even accessing some of these funds because of they are small businesses basically. So a lot of our focus now is just enabling our members to interface with the federal government, um, giving them resources to access the funds as they become available, also to make sure that as funds come avail become available, we are eligible. We worked really hard as you all were considering the legislation in the first place to define public power which is oftentimes hard, even though we're affiliated with municipalities, in some cases we look more like a rural electric cooperative, countywide. So we, had, we have to define ourselves very specifically. 
So we want to make sure those definitions hold as funds are made available, and that's some of our work that we do at APPA as well. Um, but one of the, the nice things about being smaller is that um, you can really deploy resources. We're very tied to what our community needs are. We can be very nimble, and we can deploy resources that have an immediate impact on the communities that we serve. We've already done that with solar, with smaller wind, um, with what we call community solar, actually, which is kind of like a community pool. We've done this already, um, but now as we accept some of these funds, we can be even more innovative. We can take advantage of newer technologies or build on those existing technologies to really meet the needs of our communities. And we look forward to doing that. So I'll stop there. I know we're going to get into some of the details, but just want to give you a little bit of that purview. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. That was a great presentation. Uh, our fourth panelist is Bill Parsons. Bill is Vice President for Federal and State Affairs at American Clean Power Association. And thank you, and uh, good to be here with you all. It's a bit of a homecoming for me. I actually, I was a staffer for 14 years, uh, during which time um, I, uh, I was, uh, I staffed the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. Uh, and so it's fun to be back here uh, in this forum with my colleagues. Let me in that regard also, I know uh, Senator Crapo's office, Senator Reed's office, um, uh, uh, Congressman Kine's office uh, and and others um, have put a lot of work into this event. Let me let me thank them for that. Uh, uh, American Clean Power Association. Uh, if I hope some of you have received it, an email from me from time to time. Now we get to we're in person. We get to meet each other, which is nice. Um, we're the unified voice of the utility scale uh, clean power industry. I'll define it because it's important to you sort of understand. Uh, I'm talking about uh, onshore wind offshore wind, utility scale solar, the transmission to get resource to load, and increasingly green hydrogen. Um, our members, uh, and I Joyce, Joyce correct, largely, our, our, our members are largely developers. They kind of um, build and operate well over 80% of the utility scale power, uh, clean power in the United, United States. Uh, we do have some utilities, though. Uh, and uh, increasingly utilities are getting in the game of um, uh, renewable development uh, and owner and operatorship. Okay, so the, having set the table like that, I want, there are sort of four uh, kind of key things about the bill or IIJA that I want to leave you with this afternoon. The first is transmission. And, and, and the most important thing I'm going to say about transmission actually is not money. The IIJA contained backstop siting authority for transmission. I want you, if you would, go back in time with me to the Eisenhower era, the 1950s, uh, or before when we didn't have an interstate highway system, and what the country looked like, and what, how commerce flowed or didn't, and what needed to happen in order, of, and what we take for granted today in terms of I've got a daughter who goes to college in Minnesota, I live in Maryland, I can get there pretty quickly. Um, that's because the nation made an investment in interstate highways. Um, and when I say investment, I mean they were willing to pay for it. And they were willing to permit and site it. Okay? We're having difficulty with that today. Today's transmission system started, as Malcolm knows, uh, with hydro, uh, going back to the, uh, the New Deal era, went through uh, connecting coal to the grid in the 50s and 60s. We're now building a clean energy grid in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in this century and we're going to need to connect resource to load. Those resources are not, nece not necessarily where the old facilities have been. Uh, uh, the estimates are we're going to need to have a 60% increase um, in uh, high capacity transmission. Those are the interstate highway lines uh, of the grid, uh, and that's going to cost in excess of $300 billion as a public-private capital investment. So I ask you to keep that in mind. If you or your boss are interested in kind of leaning forward as it relates to the clean energy transition, especially as it relates to the power grid, we can build all the generation we want. We need to connect that generation from where it's produced to where it's going to be consumed. That's going to require some more transmission. In addition to grid reliability, which obviously in, in recent times we've had a lot of experience with the shortcomings in that area. So transmission, one is a backstop siting authority. The second is some funding in the transmission facilitation program, which will be helpful. There are other things Congress can do, but I want to plant a seed. Transmission is going to be really important to the clean energy future we're trying to build. Okay, that's thing one. 
Uh, thing two, uh, energy storage has been mentioned, and I, all, we're for all technologies, pumped hydro in, including. There's a big, there's about $7 billion in the IAJA for uh, supply chain as it relates to uh, energy storage. This is a particularly important as it relates to lithium uh, and, and building that out. This is something I detect a great deal of bipartisan interest in, that if we're going to have um, these technologies, we want to be able to source as much of it as possible. Uh, in the United States. I think it's unrealistic to think, and we don't hold very many other industries to a standard of 100% uh, uh, sourcing uh, domestically, but we, we can and should have more, uh, and that would be healthy for jobs, uh, healthy for, for security of supply chains and the industries four square for it. Hydrogen. Um, uh, Kelly had mentioned uh, hydrogen hubs. The law requires a minimum of four. We think they ought to go big. We think they ought to go 10. Um, also, we think it's important to have a life cycle analysis in terms of how we are defining clean hydrogen. Um, I will just say that for people who are just getting into hydrogen, a lot of interest in, in my member companies in hydrogen, two ways to make it today, methane reformation, so natural gas, or electrolysis, where you, you uh, use an electrolyzer turning uh, water, splitting the uh, hydrogen uh, atom from water. Um, my member companies are interested in the latter, uh, and I'd encourage people to look into the differences in terms of um, uh, the emissions profile of each. Uh, obviously, to the degree that we're curtailing uh, renewable resources today because the, the, the capacity at the time is exceeding what the demand is on the grid, you can store that or you can use it to make hydrogen in the future, which has a lot of um, energy uh, you know, use cases. Lastly, um, this, I want, this is I want a particular shout out for any members uh, of your bosses are on the Commerce Committee uh, or uh, the uh, authorizers for the NDAA. There is a provision, it's a maritime crewing provision, okay? I mention in this context because the IIJA had a provision in it to make um, uh, huge offshore wind construction vessels. Where it's, what's weird about the offshore wind industry is that most of the time the U.S. is leading in industry. Most of the time we're leading the world. In the case of offshore wind, we're actually behind. Europe is way ahead of us in offshore wind. Uh, so are places in Asia, which means that they have, that they have built the vessels to do very specialized work. In the United States today, we have about 82% of the vessel hours are going to be U.S. flagged and, 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 uh, and crewed by U.S. Uh, mariners. Now, there's an interest in that remaining 18% of having that be available here, too. The industry shares that interest. Uh, in the IIJA, they made uh, those construction uh, vessels eligible for funding out of the loan program office. It's not Kelly's office at DOE, but it's an adjacent office run by Jigger Shaw. That was important, and it was, as important was that it was it an was incentive approach to trying to close that last 18% gap as it relates to uh, the, the uh, country of origin of the vessel as well as the nationality of the crew that mans it. Uh, I want to call this out because the House passed a, a bill that includes a, a, a crew requirement um, that, that uh, says 120 days from enactment, you got to, everybody has to be either all American or all the nationality of the, of the, of the, where the vessel being used is, is flagged. Um, it's, it is literally going to freeze the first 19 offshore wind projects in its tracks. These, these vessels were beginning, actually one of my utility members, Dominion, is building a 500 million uh, a construction vessel in Texas today. It'll be the first U.S. flagged of its kind. $500 million, and it'll take several years to build. And then we need, then we need to train people to, 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 to crew it. So there's an interest in moving in that direction, but we need to be realistic about time frames as it relates to mandates on how these vessels are crewed if we don't want to freeze uh, uh, the offshore wind industry before it has a chance to begin. Um, let, me, let me stop there because I think questions are important and, and throw it back to you, Dan. Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, that sounds great. Um, really appreciate it. I'd like to invite, Malcolm, we'll start with you and then we'll hear from Joy and then to Bill. I'd like to invite you to riff on what Kelly and I were talking about a little bit earlier, and that is sort of what your respective organizations see in terms of vision for 2030, um, whether it's emissions reductions, whether it's energy system modernization, whether it's infrastructure investments, maybe it's infrastructure investments that haven't yet been provided but that need to be provided in order to get us to where we need to be. So, Malcolm, I'll invite you to go first. I think the, um, I mean, the overall direction of the grid, we all want... Uh, a reliable grid. We all want a clean grid. Um, and I think our reliability, as we're increasingly dependent on all forms of electronics, the reliability becomes more important, uh, as is our appreciation of, of the need for it to be clean. What I think is is lacking, and I think um, I'm hoping that this conversation changes, changes quickly, is um, there, there seems to be 
a focus over the last uh, generation on gigawatts. How do we build more gigawatts of clean? And I think that is, uh, that's great when you're going from 10 to 20 percent renewables. Um, but as you're getting into deeper decarbonization and higher levels of renewables, we need to think about the reliability. Um, how do you keep the grid going? And I'm, I'm riffing off of what, what um, Kelly said, you know, if the administration reaches their goal of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind, fantastic, love it. That's gigawatts that is going to cycle on and off with their capacity factor. And when you suddenly have gigawatts cycling off, how do you keep the grid on? And we have this, we have an answer that happens now. In fact, uh, just uh, I think it was last summer, maybe a couple years ago, there was a nuclear power plant. Um, uh, I think Seabrook tripped offline uh, up in uh, New England on a hot summer afternoon. And the lights in Boston didn't flicker because we had pumped storage. Um, and Bear Mountain and some of the other uh, facilities were able to instantly reduce, uh, produce gigawatts of generation. But we can't just build gigawatts. We need to also build the corresponding storage capacity, which is probably a mix of short-term battery lithium as well as longer duration pump storage facilities. And uh, that's not just going to happen. Um, the second piece I'll add in terms of um, uh, what we need to do is preserve the existing fleet. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the existing hydropower fleet is at risk. And those are the facilities that, um, that firm up the rest of the resources. Um, now that we've got solar, maybe you don't need to run the hydro facilities during the day, um, but let's run them at night as the solar ramps off. Um, actually, despite the drought in the West, hydro has been producing twice as much as expected in the West in those hot summer afternoons because they simply save their, save their water so they can produce it when they know that solar is going to ramp off. And the irony is they don't get paid to do that. They're generating fewer hours but more important hours and, they, and, and they're doing it at an economic loss in order to keep the system operating. So we somehow have to align um, the reliability needs. Joy? Thanks. Um, so again, Malcolm said a lot of, of really important things there that I agree with. Um, I'm going to lead this off by saying, uh, and, and most of you in the room will not remember this person, but there was a radio um, comment or radio host who had a saying when he signed off of his um, his radio show every every night or, or every week, and it was keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. And it was a guy named Casey Kasem, and I think that's where we need to be in 2030 and actually now, um, and then moving forward after that. So in the electric sector, we have to keep our feet on the ground. We have to provide reliable and affordable energy. And I add the affordability piece because we we recognize I think even in public power where our customers pay all of the bills. There are no shareholders. Any additional costs flow directly to our customers, our retail customers, our, you know, our homes and businesses. Um, but we also recognize and our communities recognize sometimes getting to this clean energy transition is going to be more expensive. It's why the IIJA is so important because it helps defray some of that expense. The federal government and sort of we collectively are saying let's invest in some of these things so that it's not hitting the pocketbooks of especially after some of the, things, the challenges we've been facing and we're still facing today in our economy. Um, so we have to keep doing that. We have to provide reliable power. And, and I think our concern in public, in public power is that if we see reliability suffer, we might take a, have to take a step back from driving toward more the clean energy future because people will start to get a little bit worried about what that means. So we have to keep those things front of mind as we reach for the stars with these new technologies, which is also enabled by IIJA in many cases. And I think it does a good job of balancing those two um, pieces, or those three pieces, actually. That, well, the feet on the ground and the reaching for the stars. So I think uh, I, I envision that in 2030 is that we've done that effectively and that we've moved forward to uh, enable some of these new technologies. Maybe we're farther along with hydrogen. We have uh, additional hydropower technologies we're looking at. We have things like small modular reactors. We have to have this baseload capacity. Malcolm keeps saying it, meaning however you want to couch it. You can call it baseload. You can call it whatever you want. But we need to have some type of electricity that you can produce 24-7, essentially 365. That has to be there or else we're going to have reliability concerns. And right now, what we can, we can do there is, is nuclear certain types of fossil fuels and hydropower, essentially. I mean, there's a little bit of a, a you know, I call it baseload because you can use it in that, in that way, especially, you know, certain types of technologies. 
So we need to enhance that base load capacity, particularly on the green side. And our members are inv heavily invested in these types of new base load technologies, whether it be looking at hydrogen, whether it be um, investing in more affordable and, and potentially um, just more widespread nuclear in the form of small modular reactors. We have our members who are heavily invested with Department of Energy out west to explore that. We also need to keep those, those resources that exist online. As Malcolm is mentioning with the hydropower, we need to make sure that the federal government and, frankly, that state and local governments aren't putting additional barriers to siting and permitting that's making some of these things uneconomic. And we're seeing it across the board, not just with um, existing kind of resources, but, but even with cleaner resources like solar and some of the utility-scale solar. It's tough to get those things in the ground. Um, at the same time, I think the last thing I would mention on the, the 2030 piece is we're really balancing transmission, sort of that bulk transmission, meaning those big transmission lines you see that go interstate that Bill talked about with distribution lines, the lines that go into homes and businesses and the grids that support that retail side. We need to be building up capacity in both arenas because we're seeing things like distributed energy resources, electric vehicle deployment, that's all distribution level investment that, again, the IIJA supports and envisions, while we also need to continue to invest in our bulk transmission system and generation system. So we need a balance of both. And in public power, we want to make sure that the cost doesn't get too out of whack on, on either side, which is why, again, these investments are important. And we certainly support that expedited siting authority that was included. We tried to do it once before in the 2005 Energy Act, and we were unable to kind of make that happen. So great support for that. Again, just balancing those investment opportunities, making sure we are providing reliable, affordable, and clean and sustainable power in 2030. Thanks, Joy. Bill? I want to make three quick points. Um, one is, so... Uh, Let's stipulate that uh, technologies like wind and solar are intermittent or variable sources of power. That's just a fact. They are. Okay. I, the conclusion that people should not reach, though, that I think sometimes get, gets conflated, is that intermittent or variable is unreliable. So grid reliability is a real thing. And, and, and Joy's members, I mean, they're on the hook for it. So they, they got to concern themselves with it. So do my utility scale members. I get it. My utility scale, my utility members, um, uh, today, the ones who have committed to, to net zero and have goals, um, they already today, you have moments in time where states and power markets are operating at, at, at uh, levels of renewable integration as high as 80%. Okay, nationally, we're, we were 14% of the generation mix last year. At times, in certain areas, we have been 80%. Now, you didn't hear about it because there was no reliability issue. So I, I don't want you automatically to think that variable or intermittent is inherently unreliable. It's not. It depends on, it depends on grid planning. What my, what my utility scale members will say is they can see, they have visibility, they think, into the, into the first 80%. It's that last 20% that they're still trying to figure out. We're at 14% today. There's plenty of room to grow, okay, uh, without compromising reliability. Uh, two, the 30 by 30 goal for offshore wind. All my members, everybody who's going to build that is, is a member of the American Clean Power Association. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that if we don't get policy right, not only do you not get 30 by 30, you, don't, you get zero. Okay, th this is really important. This will be my, and this ties into my last point. I'm not meaning to be sort of, you know, um, Donnie Downer here, but I, next, uh, tomorrow, and please be on the lookout for this, we'll be releasing, a, one of the things the Trade Association does is it releases um, aggregated data about deployment and sort of industry statistics. According to our, our 2Q report for 2022, Renewable deployment, clean power deployment fell year over year by 55% in the second quarter of this year. So people, especially my friends who you know, would come to an event like this, you get used to hearing stories about you know, every year it just seems year over year we're setting new records and it's almost as if that's a birthright or that's inevitability that's going to happen. Unfortunately, it's not. It can happen. It must happen. If we're going to hit 80% decarbonization in the grid by 2030, we have to be doubling annual uh, levels of annual deployment. We're falling by more than 50% year over year. Why? Trade, tax, supply chain, some pandemic, some of the stuff, uh, uh, prices of commodities. 
uh, permitting and siting. But there are things you can do. I just, what I want to leave you with today is the progress that we've made is super important, and the progress that we need to make is not inevitable. It will turn in large part on the decisions that you make and the, po and the, and the, and the policy support um, that it will require. And failing that, um, it would be very easy to miss and by a wide mark. Um, and I, I just think that's an important point to, to make. Can, can I just jump in really quickly and say um, uh, what Bill said is important on supply chain as well? And I think that would be another vision for me of 2030 is to be able to solve that because we're also putting pressure on supply chain as we invest more in, in you know, these, these new technologies that we appreciate under the IIJA and that we need to deploy. So we've got to figure that out, I think, as a country, and it's, it's heartening to see that there has been some thought put into it by this administration, by, by many in Congress, by many in industry, and it's across the board. It includes for very fundamental things like distribution transformers we're having major constraints around. So I'm hopeful we can resolve that while we are, because I think that's probably part of the constraint, yes. is that, you know, just the lack of availability. Um, so I, I want to just echo that as well and, uh, and, and make sure we're aligned as much as possible kind of across the clean energy and utility spectrum to try to figure that one out. Thanks, Joy. I think that was a really important point. Thanks for adding that. We are at the conclusion of panel one at the 2022 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum. Malcolm, Joy, Bill, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your perspective. As our uh, first panel excuses themselves, um, not only did we conclude, we concluded on time. And so now we'll be joined via a uh, pre-recorded message, Senators Reed and Crapo. While my colleague Omri is getting that set up, you heard a lot of great uh, topics come up. You heard about hydrogen, offshore wind, uh, all of these things. Uh, we've actually been covering a lot of those in uh, congressional briefings that have been virtual. So I encourage everyone, if you're interested in learning about any more of those topics, visit us online at www.esi.org. We have a lot of great resources about that. All right, I'll turn it over to Armory. Thanks so much, Senator Reed, Senator Crapo, for talking with me today uh, at the start of our 2022 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum. Um, the two of you have been co-chairs of the Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus for some time, so thanks so much for your leadership. And that's the first question I'd like to ask you, Senator Reed. Uh, I'll start with you. Why did you decide that you wanted to be a co-chair of the Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus? And what is it about renewable energy and energy efficiency that makes you so enthusiastic? Well, first, time, uh, first it was an opportunity to work with Mike Crapo again, who is uh, one of uh, the most uh, decent and effective members of the Senate. Uh, second, uh, we all recognize that this has huge environmental consequences. Uh, in my state, the ocean state, uh, water is rising. We're seeing it. In fact, they're projecting significant uh, disruptions of bridges and other areas. So it has that effect. And then in my capacity as chairman of the Armed Services Committee, it's a national security issue. Uh, the, the effects of climate uh, are creating problems with rising seas and also desertification, uh, lower water levels, levels in the West. Uh, it will affect our agriculture, it will affect everything. So uh, moving uh, to renewables is the most logical and the only thing we can do. Mm -hmm. Senator Crapo? Well, first I have to return the kind compliments. <laughs> Jack and I have a great relationship. Uh, I think that we show that bipartisanship really does work and exists in the United States Senate. So it's a, it's a pleasure to work Thanks, with Jack on this. Um, and I agree with what Jack said. I only I can't say that Idaho has a seashore, but no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have a different dynamic. We are one of the leading states in the United States on uh, clean energy. Eighty percent of Idaho's energy comes from clean energy. Sixty percent from hydropower. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of rivers and a lot of hydropower, and uh, twenty percent from renewables. We also have uh, the nation's leading national uh, nuclear laboratory, the Idaho. National Laboratory, and right now we're developing at that laboratory. Uh, my understanding is they are looking toward over the next five, six, eight years the construction of four new nuclear reactors, including a commercial reactor and a number of test reactors, and really leading in nuclear energy. So the opportunity to work with this caucus and to work with Jack and find bipartisan 
solutions that can help us to address these issues was something that I found to be a, a wonderful opportunity. Great. Well, thank you for that. A major theme of the 2022 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum is, the infra is infrastructure, and specifically the investments in infrastructure that Congress provided last year as part of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. I'm curious, and Senator Crapo, maybe we'll start with you, I'm curious what your priorities were for the IIJA, and what do you see as the real opportunities from that bill, or that law, providing benefits to folks in Idaho or folks in Rhode Island or in everywhere in between? Well, I think that's a very good start question on this um, because, as you know, that was a bipartisan bill. And uh, the reason it got so much bipartisan support was in this era of high inflation and difficulties that we're seeing in our economy right now. Uh, this bill focused on supply side spending. It was counter and is counter inflationary. And the point I want to make there is that the most appealing part of it to me was that we had an opportunity to do some of the investing in our infrastructure that we had fallen behind on for years and we had an opportunity to do it in a way that was offset. It did not cost any additional spending. We reallocated spending dollars and offset the spending. We got supply side spending underway and we got focused on a lot of really critical things. So when you talk about the specifics of what did it mean for Idaho, we have all the things that, uh, that are traditional hard infrastructure, roads, bridges, airports, waterways, and those were all important. But it also had funding in it for firefighting mm -hmm. and for managing our natural resources in Idaho in a way that will help to protect and grow those resources, which are ways where we can have CO2 capture, mm -hmm. carbon capture, and uh, had a lot of other benefits. And one last one that's probably more specific to Idaho than Rhode Island mm -hmm is it extended the Secure Rural Schools program that helped our counties in states or in, in, in counties where the percentage of federal ownership of property is so high mm -hmm. to be able to deal with their county infrastructure. Again, roads, bridges, police support, schools, and so forth. So this was a really big deal, I think, across America. Yep. Well, I concur with, with Mike. This is a, a really big deal and long overdue. Uh, and it was bipartisan for the reasons Mike indicated. It, it made sense, it served the needs of every American, and it did it in a very responsible way. One of the issues that concerned me was the overall electric grid. Uh, it's been estimated that we lose about $70 billion a year from the failure of the grid. So this legislation puts in roughly $65 billion for constructing a much more robust and effective grid, which we'll need going forward. Another area is with electric vehicles and charging stations. You know, the, the automobile companies are telling us that by 2030, 2035, they're just gonna produce electric vehicles. We have to have the infrastructure to support them. And that would be a tremendous uh, gain. I talked about national security before. Well, you know, if we were all electric in terms of our transportation, the price of oil would not be a hundred plus dollars a barrel, it would be much less and the oil uh, dynasties would not be as dynastic. So that's a great opportunity, I think, for us. And then finally, when you take it back down to the, some of the programs that affect r real people and real communities uh, in Idaho and Rhode Island, there's money for weatherization, home weatherization. And I've been very supportive of that. And when you invest in making a home uh, more energy resilient. You put in uh, better insulation. You ch ch change out, and some of our boilers were put in the 1920s. You change them out for more efficient heating. You're, you're saving on, on the demand for energy and, and heat. And you're also, it's a much more uh, friendly uh, home, for particularly for children. Yep. Um, many of the speakers at the Congressional Energy Efficiency, or Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum are leaders across, or from across the clean energy industry, the clean energy sector. And the businesses that they represent employ millions of people. Their companies invest billions of dollars in renewable energy and energy efficiency. I'm curious, Senator Reid, what are some opportunities you see for the private sector and the federal government to partner to increase opportunities to deploy renewable energy and energy efficiency? And, do you think it's possible that we could also be helping states and local governments 
enter into more public-private partnerships? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we are the first state, Rhode Island, that has offshore wind. Uh, it's only six towers, but it's the, the beginning of a much more robust offshore wind industry uh, along the East Coast. And that was uh, a public-private partnership uh, and with federal resources. Uh, we had the Corps of Engineers involved, BOEM from the Department of Interior. Uh, the, the basic setup is the, uh, the towers replace the energy on Block Island, and then we have a line into the mainland to take the uh, excess energy. But that's an example of public-private partnership. It was a private company that did it. And the other thing that was so exciting about it, it uh, uh, generates other economic activity. We have boat builders in Rhode Island that are building specific, specific vessels to get out to the towers and do servicing. So that's an example of how public-private cooperation. Then we have, uh, we've got our SBIR program, Small Business Program. They're looking for companies like you described to invest in and help. Uh, so th this has to be done and more efficiently by a public-private partnership. Senator Crapo? Well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm on the finance committee, and so the first thoughts I have in response to mm -hmm. your question relate to a couple of bills that we're working on in tax policy. Because if we can incentivize opportunities in the private sector for public-private partnerships and for in private sector investment in these types of things, that helps a lot. Uh, I am a lead co-sponsor. I'm the lead Republican with Senator Whitehouse on uh, legislation called ESIC. It's the, uh, I can't remember exactly what the acronym exactly means, but the, the Energy Security Innovation Act, I believe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is, a, this is a tax credit uh, that, and an investment credit for uh, technology neutral clean energy solutions. It's not trying to pick winners and losers mm -hmm. in this whole situation, but in trying to in incentivize investment and production of technologies so that we can move and provide the incentive from the federal government for those technologies to be developed. Another one is, is I can't remember the name of it either, but it, it expands master limited partnership mm -hmm. access to the, the tax benefits of investing in clean energy um, projects. And right now those are limited basically to fossil fuel and mm -hmm. timber and uh, minerals, I think. This expands it to clean energy types of technologies so that, so that those investment vehicles can attract the capital that will get us into those technologies. And then coming from a state that's very heavily, um, I, I guess you would say, resource oriented from forests and mm -hmm. deserts and things like that, <clears throat> there's, there is the Growing Climate Solutions Act which increases the focus and availability of land management and agricultural management practices that will help greater increase our carbon capture. Uh, and then finally, I, I always want to start coming back to nuclear. I'm a big fan of nuclear energy, and Idaho, of course, as I said, is the home of the Idaho National Laboratory. And there's legislation called NECA, which uh, is, I think, a phenomenal effort to move forward the development of nuclear energy in the United States by building those exact partnerships. It creates, the, it creates a special program at the Idaho National Lab, but then that program helps to facilitate uh, by working with the nuclear energy, uh, the, the nuclear energy regulator. Mm -hmm. So we've got the laboratory and the regulator, which are the government side of it, it coordinates with academia, so the research and other development that goes on in academia can be facilitated, and then it works with private sectors. And that's why one of those reactors I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier that is going to be developed in Idaho at that lab is a, is a commercial reactor. But it will have gone through that partnership with our government laboratory, with the regulator, and with academia and with the private sector to get these advanced reactors moving along into a greater development. Great. Well, it means a great deal to everyone who's attending the Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo for the two of you to take some time and talk with me and share some thoughts about infrastructure and um, you know, sort of what we've done. My final question is a look to the future. Uh, and I'm curious, Senator Crapo, we'll start with you if that's all right. Sure. What do you see on the horizon for renewable energy and energy efficiency? Are there new technologies or new areas of interest that you have that makes you especially optimistic for renewable energy and energy efficiency going forward? 
Well, you know, I'm not one of the experts on all of the different things that are moving along. I understand that about 35% of what we need is in the developmental stage right now. And so those incentives that I've already talked about, I, I think, are some of the most important things. I do have to come back to nuclear. Mm -hmm. You know, we're moving ahead. Uh, and by the way, this makes us more competitive with China and Russia. Uh, it's great for our national security. Mm -hmm. And there's a tremendous amount of potential in nuclear energy. And one of the things that I do know about that, that's coming are these new reactors, the new scale small modular reactor that is going to be built in Idaho. And there, I'm not just talking about reactors in Idaho. The development of the capacity of safe, uh, nuclear energy, I think, is one of the biggest solutions that we can look for. And uh, there, are, there are a number of other things. <clears throat> uh, you know, we're having a big debate in the Senate right now over semiconductors. Now, I, I don't know that semiconductors alone are what will help get us there, but they are critical. And having American production of semiconductors is something that I think is going to facilitate the technological advancement of clean energy uh, policy. And... Uh, so those are some of the things that just jumped to my mind right now. I know it's a little bit technical, but, but again, I think one of the things the government can do most here is to incentivize and, and help provide the backing and the partnershiping with those who are out there doing the thinking about what really needs to be the next steps in these areas. Senator Reid, I think this gives you the last word. Well, uh, I agree with uh, Mike in terms of the potential for nuclear power. Uh, particularly the small reactors, uh, and there's been a, a huge amount of federal research on fusion, yep. which is a, the, could be the key, and also the experience which the Navy has had over, since Admiral Rickover, of operating safely nuclear reactors. That's part now of the mainstream of both economic and uh, academic, rather, and industrial knowledge. So that's another form of collaboration. Uh, I think, though, uh, offshore wind is, has a huge potential. Uh, we are looking at projects now that are off the coast of Massachusetts and Rhode Island and off the coast of Long Island, significant projects that will provide significant electricity to those areas. Uh, and then also, I think, if we can uh, electrify our transit systems so that uh, they're more efficient and cheaper. One of the ironies is my home state ripped of the Rhode Island Public Transportation Authority had a fixed price for fuel for two dollars. That contract ran out this month. <laughs> I don't think they're going to get the same type of contract, but if they have electric buses, it's they're fine. So I think that's another area. Solar energy, wind energy, all these things. I don't think there'll be one solution. It's going to be a comprehensive solution that will be sort of pulled together ultimately by the, a, a national grid to deliver power to homes, to factories, and charging stations on the road to make sure we can stay mobile. Well, thank you so much, Senator Reed, Senator Crapo. Mm -hmm. Thanks for taking time to talk with me a little bit today. Look forward to working with both of you in the future and also have to just give a quick plug for your great staffs to help us bring, to get, help bring us together today, but also help us organize the, the policy forum. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I totally agree with that. Great staff. Um, Senators Reed and Crapo have been tremendous uh, supporters of the 2022 um, renewable Ener Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum. And that brings us to our second panel. So we have four uh, tremendous uh, leaders from, the clean from across the clean energy sector. They'll be joining me right now, I think, to um, have a seat. And we're going to talk about uh, infrastructure and buildings and workforce and uh, pick up where our first panel left off. Uh, one plug you heard on our first panel, you heard Senator Crapo talking about, there's a fly up here, um, uh, a lot of talk about uh, advanced modular reactors, advanced nuclear reactors. We actually have a panelist on our fourth panel today from Idaho National Lab who is a leading researcher and will actually be specifically talking about exactly what Malcolm and Joy and others have been talking about. How do you integrate renewable resources onto the grid along with energy efficiency? See, I said energy efficiency. Uh, and, uh, and do it in a way that's, that also has dispatchable resources. So um, I'm Dan Brissett with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And I'm joined by many of my colleagues today. We're all wearing these little pins. So I hope if you see any of us, please 
talk with us, and, uh, and we're looking forward to having some in-person networking. This is our first in-person panel in a while. It's great to be back up here. Um, we will hear from our four panelists. We'll have a good Q&A. Uh, we have a couple hundred people watching the webcast, uh, which is great. Uh, if you have questions in our online audience, you can follow us online. Uh, Twitter is at EESI online, and you can send us questions that way. You can also send us an email. The email address to use is ask. ASK at ESI.org. For folks in the room, you have questions. My colleague Savannah uh, is up here in the front. Catch her eye, and um, we have some note cards and some pens, and she'll, she'll feed the questions into the discussion that way. Without any further ado, I'm going to give each of my panelists brief introductions. And the first is Paula Glover. Paula is the president of the Alliance to Save Energy, one of my alma maters, yeah. uh, where I learned the ropes when it comes to clean energy policy. So, Paula, Great to see you today. Thank I'm looking you. forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Is this on? This is on now, yeah. So thank you so much, one, for having me, and thank you all for being here. Um, as Dan said, I'm the president of the Alliance to Save Energy. So for those of you who may not be familiar with us as the Alliance, um, we are a bipartisan coalition. We are a 45-year-old organization, um, and our focus is advocacy around efficiency. And so I want to kind of just highlight for you the importance of efficiency in these conversations, whether it's just about um, a clean energy transition, a just energy transition. Um, I'm going to argue that efficiency is foundational to that um, and really what's going to get you there. But it is often that tool that is forgotten about um, because we're not talking about producing something clean. We're talking about not using something. Um, and every electron therm that you don't have to use is as big a savings as producing something clean and using that. I would suggest it's even better. And so efficiency is really important in that way. Also, when we think about the economic um, environment and opportunity for jobs, which we talk a lot about, but also small business, efficiency really is where we need to be focused and where we should start. Um, the latest jobs report, the U.S. Energy and Employment Jobs Report, talked about the fact that the energy sector has about 7.1 million jobs in the United States, 7.8, excuse me, jobs in the United States. 2.2 of those million of those jobs is energy efficiency jobs. So energy efficiency is actually the largest employer in this sector. And when we think about efficiency employment, I want you to think about things like not just energy audits, which is typically the thing that may come to mind first is the folks who do energy audits, but think about manufacturers of HVAC systems, manufacturers of lighting systems, um, think about building managers, um, folks who develop, um, create insulation, new technologies that make our grid more interactive, our buildings interactive, all of those things can be defined as efficiency jobs. And the good news with that is that it requires a whole, um, a whole slew of skills. So it's not just folks who have four-year degrees, although we absolutely need people who have four-year degrees, master's degrees, PhDs. We also need people who work in the trades. We also need people who are working in construction. We need all of it in this business. And so it creates a lot of opportunity for jobs and growth in the efficiency industry. Second to that, though, is how do we do this well so that every household and small business has an opportunity to adopt so that efficiency measures are accessible to them? That means that they are available and that they are affordable um, and that they are able to adopt them. But also, because efficiency jobs exist in about 99.6% of the counties in the United States, I think it's like seven counties in the U.S. do not have an efficiency job. That also means there's great opportunity for small business growth and development. And as we start to talk about, as a country, a just energy transition, right? We talk about a clean energy transition, but we also talk of just transition. That just transition suggests that we want to include all communities around the country. And that may be in direct employment, but it also is about small business growth and development. And so I use the, the um, data around where efficiency jobs exist because that also means that those are opportunities, those are jobs that are local, and that means that those are opportunities for people to create small businesses and hire and grow in that way. Um, and so just finally, just to say to all of you, as you're thinking about this transition and the work that you do and the type, type of policies that we need to have in place, please think about efficiency. And I would ask you to think about efficiency first as you're beginning to develop all of this stuff 
because not spending money on something is always going to be better than spending a little bit on the same thing. Thank you, Paula. That's a great way to kick off our panel today. Our second panelist is Jason Walsh. Jason is Executive Director of the Blue Green Alliance. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Paul, it's nice to be on a panel with you when we're both fully embodied humans in person at the same time. It's kind of mind-bending, uh, but, but a privilege. Um, so uh, as Dan said, I'm Jason Walsh, the Executive Director of the Blue Green Alliance. We are uh, a coalition of labor unions and environmental organizations who collectively represent about 15 million uh, members and supporters in this country. Our two original very odd bedfellows when we created the Blue Green Alliance back in 2006 were the Sierra Club and the Steelworkers Union. And we have since grown to encompass 13 national and international labor unions and environmental groups. Um, we work on public policy. Um, like the Alliance to Save Energy. Um, I, I do want to, um, Paul, I'm glad you, you raised the, the latest energy jobs report. Um, and, and maybe I'll just uh, add to what you already said by, I mean, those numbers are kind of eye-popping, yeah. right? And, and we haven't even begun to see the level of investment that we're going to need to see to make this transition. And I think part of the reason for that, that that gets less comment, but I'll just say it out loud, is that the, the, the clean energy, energy efficiency economy is, is inherently a more labor intensive economy than an economy that's based on fossil fuels and waste, <laughs> right? Uh, we are in the power sector manufacturing and installing the sources of our fuel rather than burning them. That creates more jobs. In, uh, in the building sector, energy efficiency turns wasted energy into work. Right? So that goes from no jobs <laughs> to lots of jobs, uh, 2.1 million, as Paula just said. So we care a lot about job creation. We've done a lot of work on it over the last decade plus, but we are much more focused on job quality, job access, and, and where jobs are created. Um, and there are many great things to say ab about the, the clean energy economy that has really, over the last decade, 12 years, really burst uh, out and become a significant part of the national economy. But we still got some work to do. Right? And in particular, uh, not enough of the jobs that have been created to date are high quality, family supporting jobs. Um, a number of the occupations, sort of the, the the signifier applications across a number of different sectors don't pay as much on average compared to similar occupations in incumbent energy sectors. So we got to change that. Union density rates are lower on the whole, although that's getting better. And that, that data point is related to the first data point about job quality. And um, to date, at least many of these jobs have not been created in the communities that need them most. And from a BGA standpoint, the communities we, we are particularly focused on are deindustrialized communities, um, energy transition communities, and Justice 40 communities. And obviously, there are both policy and political reasons for changing that status quo. Right? I mean, from a policy standpoint, this is, this is an issue of equity and fairness. Right? We, as we build this new energy economy, we want to make it better and fairer and more equitable and more inclusive than the economy we're, we're, we're evolving out of. Um, but I would submit that, that there are some very fundamental political economy reasons for doing that as well, right? which is that if workers, working people, and in particular uh, you, the unions who represent them, who are the union workers are the only really organized political constituency uh, for workers in this country, if, they, if, if, if their members are not getting as much or more work <laughs> out of this new economy we're trying to build uh, as the, as the fossil-based economy that, that, that we are moving away from, it, it will be, they will be very hard-pressed to support it. Right? They've got to see that direct economic benefit. I think the same principle applies to communities. Right? If, if, a, if a community individually or an entire region uh, is left behind or perceives themselves to be left behind, they, they are going to resist the, the transition that we're in the middle of here. So how do we address that? Well, we think we address it by public policy in very intentional ways. And, and, and based on the principle that 
if we're using taxpayer dollars, if we're using public dollars, we should expect uh, the, the, the broadest public benefit from, from those investments. And we have fortunately very well established policy levers that we can use, both with regard to labor standards, domestic content standards, and then more recently some interesting ways of targeting investment that we've used in budget reconciliation that can drive investment to communities that need it the most. Um, we can talk a little bit more uh, about that, um, but I think I've hit my time. That's great, Jason. Thank you so much. Our third panelist is Kurt Rich. Kurt is president and CEO of the North American Insulation Manufacturers Association. Welcome, Kurt. Great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, again, I, uh, I, I represent the, uh, the fiberglass and the mineral wool manufacturing industry in the United States and, and Canada. There's a lot of different types of insulation, but uh, fiberglass is it's kind of the dominant insulation product that uh, that you see in buildings. It's it's about seventy percent of, uh, of 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 all residential construction. A little bit less on, on commercial construction. But if you ever, I know a lot of you probably like to wander around the aisles of Lowe's or, or Home Depot on the weekend, and you go to the SKU and see Certain Teed or Owens Corning or Knopf. Those are those are my members. It's a domestic industry, uh, all manufactured in the United States for uh, for domestic consumption. Uh, before, I, before I kick off my remarks, I just have this incredible sense of deja vu. 30 years ago, when I was a, a Senate staffer, we would have our, our monthly Montana congressional delegation uh, meetings that uh, would frequently devolve into chaos, but uh, uh, great memories. So it's, it's good to be back in this, in this room. So, you know, we're, we're here to talk about really how we, how we address the, uh, our, our climate uh, emergency, and that begins really in large measure by, by focusing on the builder sector and, and, and uh, undertaking actions that decarbonate, decarbonize our, our buildings. When you're talking about new buildings, the, the, the answer is pretty straightforward. You, you build highly efficient buildings. And, 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 and you do that now by, by simply building it in accordance with the current model energy code. So if you're building a new home, you build to the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code, the IECC. If you're building a, a commercial building, you build it to 2019 ASHRAE 90.1 standards. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, the problem is, in, in this country, we don't do that. Some states are very progressive on, on, on building energy codes. Other states are, are, are laggards, and so we have a lot, to, a lot of work to do. The pathway for decarbonizing existing buildings is a, is a little bit murkier. You know, you really kind of have two levers to do that. The first is to convince the building owner or occupant that it's in their interest to make investments to, to upgrade that, that building uh, with the knowledge that over a, a, a relatively short period of time, they will have recouped their investment and then will continue to in, in, enjoy savings through re reduced uh, uh, heating and cooling uh, utility bills. Uh, the second is, uh, is, is through either utility or, or government incentives. So that would either defray those investments that otherwise wouldn't be cost effective or just operating in tandem. And lots of studies have been done on this. At, at the end of the day, it is really hard to get people to just act in their own interest. You really need that kind of financial incentive to, uh, uh, to, to, to prompt people to act. And I, I think that's really the golden opportunity in the, in the infrastructure bill is the, 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 efficient, the money for efficiency programs that will be flowing to residential, commercial, and, and industrial uh, buildings principally through the states, but, uh, but we'll, I think will provide decent incentives for, for building owners to act. You know, in, in anticipation, let me kind of just frame the opportunity. So in, in anticipation of this money uh, becoming available, the broader insulation industry commissioned a study, and they said to the, uh, to the, to the consultant that was putting the study together, we said, we want you to look at what the emission reduction opportunities would be if you undertook very easily achievable insulation upgrade measures. So I'm not talking about crazy stuff, just very basic insulation 
uh, measures in, in residential existing buildings, commercial existing buildings, and, and, and industrial buildings. And their findings, and we'll be releasing this in a couple of weeks, if you were to undertake those very reasonable uh, improvements, it would be the equivalent of all uh, wind power generation in the country. It would displace more than a third of, of all natural gas fire generation in the country, or it would cover the home energy use of, of, of a quarter of our, of our existing homes in the country. So the opportunity is there. It's immense. We can make a, a, a real solid impact by investing in, in building energy efficiency. The Infrastructure Act isn't the whole enchilada but I think it provides a good foundation for action over the next five years. And I hope it tees us up for a kind of further investment on, on down the road. So look forward to our discussion today. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah, we need additional enchiladas, more enchiladas <laughs> for everyone, and nachos and gorditas and other things. Um, our fourth panelist today is joining us, and she's wearing two hats. Uh, Jeannie Salo is Vice President of Government Relations for, uh, for North America for Schneider Electric. And she's also a member of the board of directors of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. Jeannie, welcome to the panel. Welcome. You hear me? Okay. Well, listen, thank you. I'm so honored to be amongst this crowd. You guys are fantastic. You're doing such great work. I, I am very honored to be representing the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. For those of you who don't know about BCSE, BCSE has been around for 30 years in Washington. They do incredible work representing um, companies and trade associations all in the space of sustainable energy. Um, they put out annually um, a fact book on sustainability in America. I encourage you to go find that fact book and, and read it. Um, it's a really fantastic product. And we're proud members of the board of BCSE and very active members. But who's Schneider Electric? Schneider Electric is a company um, that is about um, $30 billion worldwide company in over 100 countries. And all over the world, we're manufacturing products, solutions, software, um, and services that create energy solutions. Um, in the U.S. is our biggest market, most important market right now. Um, and many thanks to the infrastructure bill, it's even more important. Um, and in the U.S., we manufacture in 20 facilities. We have 20,000 employees. And this job force is very exciting. Um, we're, we're transforming. Um, we're part of the clean energy jobs of the future, for sure, at Schneider Electric. Um, and we're doing some really exciting things, and I want to talk about that. But I want to just share a few like overarching comments. The clean energy industry is hiring faster than the overall national economy and is paying above average wages. Um, that's from Forbes. Um, uh, states with strong climate policies are also seeing strong job growth. So Michigan, for example, added 35,500 new energy jobs in 2021 after establishing an economy-wide net zero by 2050 goal in 2020. Um, the future of U.S. infrastructure must be about the future workforce. We are not going to be able to execute on this infrastructure plan without these jobs. Okay, I mean, first of all, just basic electricians that will be needed to electrify this landscape. Electricians are retiring at a faster rate than new electricians are being trained and coming on board. Um, these older electricians also want to take the jobs they understand and are comfortable with, um, and maybe retrofitting a building isn't one of them. Um, doing something different isn't one of them. We need to recruit and retrain and develop the labor of the future if we want to implement these dollars across the landscape. And it's also just, I, we have to, I want to really drive this home. This, this is the only way that the United States can stay competitive. Um, other countries will you know, they will evolve and, and transform their workforce um, to be clean energy competitive economies. Um, and we need to do that if we want to continue to be a competitive economy across the world. And I feel like I'd speak to that as a, as a, as representing a multinational company specifically. Um, but I really want to specifically drive home this point about digital because we often talk about the digital economy. There is no other economy. It's just the digital economy, and the and digitization is at the core of everything we need to do um, to be more efficient, to transform our infrastructure. We are connected now. IoT and IIoT, Industry Internet of Things, is crucial to the future of manufacturing in this country. 
And we have a really wonderful example in our um, smart factory in Lexington, Kentucky, which received the um, Sustainable Factory Award um, from the World Economic Forum and the Smart Factory Award. And it's a, a point of pride for us being based in Kentucky, um, which is traditionally coal country, and yet we are doing we are really executing on the future of smart manufacturing and for clean energy um, products. Um, this factory was modernized to embrace digitization, allowing the factory to embrace indus industrial IoT technologies, incre increase plant processes efficiency, and create good paying jobs. Our success in Lexington only scratches the surface of the benefits that can be found utilizing digitization tools across the economy. And by doubling down on this commitment to building a strong digital clean energy workforce, we will as a country become more competitive and we will actually inspire people to want to do these jobs. I'm sure some of you have heard about the labor shortage um, and in the world of manufacturing, it's hard to get uh, people to take these jobs actually, interestingly enough, in the United States. But at our factory, um, the people that we are upskilling with digital skills, making them, you know, they're holding, they're holding iPads and they're interfacing with technology in ways that they didn't in the past in a manufacturing job. They like this. They're interested in it. They're passionate about it. And it makes them want to stay with the company and stick with the manufacturing um, roles that they're in. Um, and that's something that we really need to embrace. And we need to work together, public-private partnerships, to create more apprenticeships and collaborations. Um, to get this done. So I just want to state, you know, it is imperative that the industry and government partner to ensure the availability of a digital workforce capable of meeting rising demands in hiring. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure um, law included several important provisions and aimed at supporting and growing the various workforces critical to the law's implementation, including transportation, EVs, energy infrastructure, energy efficiency, intelligent systems, and technologies energy-related cybersecurity, water and wastewater, telecommunications, and more. But still, the industry is facing challenging labor shortages. Um, and this is going to create a real obstacle to implementing um, the law. Um, Schneider Electric is launching many different programs to ensure that we have the right talent and skills to reach our ambitions in this new world of work. Two key programs that we're instituting at Schneider are the Returnship Program and the Bridge Program. Um, the returnship program is called Return to Work. It targets those who've been out of the workforce and looking to re-enter the workforce. So this has actually been traditionally um, women and mothers during the pandemic. We all are well aware of that situation. Um, and it's a six-month program that matches professional candidates who have taken a break from the corporate world with internal employment opportunities. Schneider sets out to train participants with the skills they need to thrive in their careers and help build their confidence with the goal of finding full-time roles after six months. Um, another key program that's very exciting that we're um, working on at Schneider is Bridge Program. The Bridge Program is designed to connect experienced professionals with new energy careers. So Schneider Electric is um, bringing in talent with non-traditional backgrounds to be reskilled and meet the current and growing demands of the new energy landscape. And so these are full-time employees who have at least a high school or GED um, degree while working for Schneider Electric. They also receive training during working hours and professional mentorship. And this is an apprenticeship program that combines formal learning with on-the-job training experiences for permanent paid positions. Um, this is just a few examples. Many other companies do things like this. And at BCSC, they, they did some research with their membership and surveyed um, at length with their members. And they came out with some important information, which was that the skills, qualifications, jobs, categories span STEM, computer science, project management, business development, marketing, customer serv service, technology, and service providers, and not just technicians or engineers. The barriers are training that's tied to real jobs and lack of awareness of clean energy careers at all in secondary schools. And another of the needs is outreach to underserved communities, which you represented, um, and that's so important. Um, outreach to students on their career opportunities and the public-private partnerships that are going to make this successful. It's a it's a confusing to navigate, and I think we need to work on that together as part of our our, our next steps. I will stop there, but um, I just want to um, just one time, one final time, say we 
we cannot be the competitive nation that we want to be if we don't get our arms around this and get and train the people of the future to do the jobs of the future, which they're going to like better. And so I think collectively, <laughs> a public-private partnership and the White House and all the powers that be and the members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, we all agree on this. This is one area where we've got to agree, and we do. So we should really figure out, we have some great tools in this toolbox, but there's more that needs to be done to untangle and make it more simplified and more effective. That's where I'll end. Thank you so much. So we have about 15 minutes or so for some Q&A. And Paula, I'm going to come back to you. Um, and we'll start and then hear from Jason and Kurt and Jeannie. Looking ahead to the implementation of IIJA or Bill or whatever we call it, where do you see sort of the, the biggest potential impacts in terms of job growth? Are there any Bill or IIJ investments from a jobs perspective that you're looking most forward to? Yeah, I think a lot of the investment in IIJ, IIJ is going to um, help create economic opportunity. So if it's weatherization, if it's money for schools, I think what's really um, important about this particular piece of legislation is not just the money that's being spent for efficiency measures across the country, though that's very mm -hmm. important, but also that there's money that's being invested in job training. I think that speaks to a little bit about what Jeannie's talking about, um, because the talent um, the, the finding talent is going to be the piece that we all are already suffering from. And it's not just a clean energy issue. This isn't a workforce issue around the country, right? Lots of industries are fighting for talent. We're all competing for people. We all have to think about workers a little bit differently. And I think what this bill does is, is having the foresight to, one, invest in training. Right, invest in nonprofits and higher education institutions that are thinking about training now um, is going to be a big deal because you're going to have to try to get people moving. And so I'm excited, I think, about all of that um, and, and knowing that that's not enough, right? But that this is not a situation that we're going to expect the government to buy our way out of. We all have to kind of contribute um, and lean in on this, but we, we can get there. Thank you. Jason, where do you see some of the most um, sort of impactful investments from the IAJA? Well, well, there, there are a number of uh, investments in, in buildings focused programs that, that we think are enormously important from, from, from an emission standpoint and a job creation standpoint. But I, I do want to build on what I said earlier, right? For us, it's not just about the job creation, it's about the job quality and access. Mm -hmm. right? So, and while there were some good labor standards, particularly around prevailing wage and domestic content, that were included within the bill. Um, it's going to take this administration and agencies to be kind of creative and flexible about the incentives they put out there, right? Whether they are uh, encouraging applicants to use project labor agreements or community workforce agreements or rewarding projects, particularly big projects that create kind of a, a talent pipeline. And even better, if, if it's a talent pipeline that starts in, in the community where the project is actually happening, right? And so, to my mind, the, the, the best developed model for that is the apprenticeship readiness program to registered apprenticeship program pathway mm -hmm. uh, that is working around the country and needs to be scaled up if we're going to get folks into these jobs and if we're going to diversify a con construction workforce in particular that badly needs to be diversified, right? Um, and in particular, women are underrepresented in the construction workforce. In particular, black Americans are, are underrepresented in the construction workforce. And, it's, and it takes intentional strategies to actually uh, change that dynamic. Um, I would also say that, that let's, let's leverage private sector dollars out there. And one of the ways to do that is leveraging the private dollars of registered apprenticeship programs. Right? I mean, the, the, you know, there are 1,600 training centers that building trades unions run with their employer association partners around the country. They collectively invest about $1.6 billion a year. If it was a four-year deg degree-granting institution, it would be the largest in the country. Um, they're going to be key partners as we try to bring this clean energy economy to scale and, um, uh, and to do it in a way that actually builds the more inclusive, equitable economy I think we all want to build. Thanks. Kurt, there's a lot of great stuff in, for buildings and in the IIJA, but where do you see yeah. the most impact from a workforce perspective? Yeah. You know, the, the one pot of money that I'm pretty excited about is the, the $250 million for building energy code adoption and, and implementation at both 
the state and the city level. Just to kind of give you a frame of reference, the DOE Building Energy Code program kind of bops along at about five to ten million a year in funding. And so this is just a, in, in energy code world, this is a, a, a unheard of level of investment. Uh, you know, and I think over five years the impact on that is as you, is you train the workforce to enforce updated codes and implement updated codes it in turn is, I think, really going to catalyze uh, energy efficient construction and just support all of the other uh, uh, initiatives that are underway uh, across building sectors to, uh, to drive uh, energy efficiency. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. And in fact, I think DOE just released their, their uh, RFI on that, or RFP on that yesterday, so it, or, or Friday, so it shows that they are. They plan on moving that money out the door quickly. Yeah. Jeannie, I think this gives you the last word on sort of where you see um, impact from these investments. It's going to be all, everywhere, all across the board, because you've got ports, airports, the EV infrastructure, buildings specifically, as you mentioned, are going to play a role in every single one of those. Um, even if you take the, the transformation that's going on with EVs and, and just in the, in the world of consumer choice, the future needs of, for electricity are going to fundamentally transform this landscape. I mean, we can't even, we don't mentally even grasp how much is going to change. But, you know, charging stations that are going to be needed everywhere you stop and each home turning into its own virtual power plant so that it can produce and consume energy is going to fundamentally change our energy landscape. And that is going to require a whole lot of new ways of thinking. We'll probably get to in one of your future questions. Um, so I'll stop there, but just say I, I think every state and local official who applies for a grant, whether it's oh, we want to put in our, an upgraded clean port or we want to put in a cleaner, more you know, net zero airport, should also be talking to the local university or the companies involved about what kind of job training program can go along with that project? Well, how do we connect the dots between each one of these projects and really build out um, the reskilling and upskilling that we need to do across the board? Thanks. Um, my next question, Jason, I'll start with you. You've, you've, Paula described sort of the energy efficiency workforce. We talked about this on the first panel as well. But I'd like to start with you. Help our audience paint a picture from your perspective of what the clean energy look for, what the clean energy workforce of 2030 needs to look like if we're going to be meeting the goals of either the Biden-Harris administration or the states that are setting these goals. Help us understand sort of what it looks like and, and what needs to change between now and then, which is, you know, it's only eight years in the future. Yeah. Um, well, as I've already mentioned, I think it's going to be, need to be younger, more diverse, more representative of the economy uh, and country as a whole. Um, let me, let me, though, make sort of two interrelated points. I mean, I, yes, th th there are going to be some new skills involved and new occupations, but, but for the most part, these are e existing skills and existing occupations, right? And, and so we, 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 we do need to, to, to train for that. But and this is not a contradiction to what I just said. Skills are actually going to matter more than ever, right? And, and, and I mean, quality of work is always important. But let me make a case for it from a climate standpoint, right? Which is, like, the climate crisis is so urgent. Like, we've only got one shot to do this right, right? And, and so, so verifiable credentialed skills for the workers who do that work is going to be absolutely fundamental because we're not going to get another go here, right? And, I mean, you, you, could, you could list off every example, right? But, but, you know, the difference between a a properly installed and maintained HVAC system <laughs> and one that is improperly installed and maintained is, is like tons of, of emission, right? And, and so I, I, think, I think that point has to be made. To get there, I mean, let's, let's just address the elephant in the room. We're going to need a functional Congress that um, actually um, can make investments and uh, pass ambitious policy that meets the moment we're in. And uh, it has been very disappointing to me and to, to our coalition members that over the last couple of weeks we've seen um, 
an inclusion of climate and energy provisions in, in reconciliation stall. We think that's unacceptable. We think as long as there is time left in this Congress and in, in, in 2022, we need to keep at it. Um, and there are any number of reasons to, to do that. Um, I, I, will, I will mention one of them that we haven't spoken to as much. I mean, as Paula mentioned this earlier, as we make this energy transition, <laughs> we've actually got to be very intentional and, and targeted about where the investments are made. The, the, the reconciliation bill that came out of the House was enormously targeted in terms of investments made to energy transition communities. Mm -hmm. uh, to take a random state as an example, West Virginia would do really, really well uh, in this kind of reconciliation legislation with these kind of targeted investments. In fact, it's to our minds the difference between uh, experiencing mostly economic pain from this transition and experiencing or getting their fair share or even more of their fair share of the economic gain of this transition. So that investment and in, in good policy and ambition are going to be absolutely critical. Kurt, let's say all of those millions of dollars are rolled out for building energy codes. What does our workforce look like? in the lead up to 2030? You know, I, I think just two quick points to address another elephant in the room. You know, our, our, our building trades are heavily reliant on, on migrant labor. And as long as our immigration laws are broken, uh, that's going to put inordinate stress on, 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 on that workforce. And so, uh, again, we need a functional government who can, who can kind of address that and, uh, and, and you know, if, if they do that, I think that, that, uh, that the, the workforce will balance out, and again, in the construction trades. And the second, I just, I'm an optimist. I continue to believe that if there's a strong market demand for, for efficiency-related products and services, that, uh, that, 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 that industry, those industries, will, will find the workforce. So I'm just, I think our imperative is to keep it as a, a growth industry that's attracting investment, uh, and, and, and uptake, and, and we'll be okay. Jeannie, you were talking about a digital workforce. There's no other alternative. Help us understand a little bit about what that looks like in 2030, and then we'll hear from Paula. Well, I mean, it, it, everything is, needs to be, everybody and everything needs to be smarter um, to maximize efficiencies. So, um, you know, an example is, you know, bringing software and real-time data analytics into a building. Let's take a building, for example. If you've connected devices in a building that understand the temperature in the room, the humidity in the room, number of people, they're sensing it, and they can converse back to, uh, take that real-time data back to a software system, right, that's going to analyze and say, let's lower the temperature here in this room right now, and, you know, and maybe we, we don't worry about the other room where nobody's standing. Um, it, these are just basic, like sort of basic fundamental examples, but integrating digitization into a building, into the grid, into anything is going to enable you to maximize efficiencies by leveraging the power of AI, IoT, all of these things that we talk about. And we have this chance as, with these investments to do this. And we cannot miss that boat. We can't continue to build infrastructure the way that we've done it before in the past. It will, it's, it's a complete waste of money. Let's just put it on its faces. You lose money, right, on the energy you lose. Um, but you're also limiting your insights into how to maximize efficiencies. I think it's really important in manufacturing as we think about manufacturing all the componentry that we need to execute on these projects. Paula, this gives you the last word. What's your vision for the energy efficiency workforce of 2030? Yeah, I mean, I think simply stated, the energy workforce of 2030 needs to look like the demographics of this country, period. Mm -hmm. And so, right, the, the, the DOE's report tells us that in 2021, 74% of the energy workforce was white and male. We're not going to make it that way, right? It's just, it's just not going to work. Um, it tells us that non-white workers, about 20%, but then they also say that the survey takers don't really know the ethnicity of the people who work for them, so maybe it's 24%, but maybe it's 26%, or maybe it's 12 right? So we don't really have good data to tell us what that number looks like, and we know that black workers represent 8% of the workforce and we're 12% of the population, right? So we've got a lot of work to do 
um, and a lot of organizations that talk about DEI and the importance. This is not a, I'm going to make you, I want you to feel good or a social justice kind of conversation, although those are great reasons mm -hmm. for us to do this. This is a, if you do not hire more women, black and brown people, you actually don't have a sustainable business because the demographics are telling you that the students who are coming through our systems are overwhelmingly female, black and brown. Joe, Jason's talked about this when he talks about community-centric hiring and how do you think about it in that way. All of this is kind of tied together. Um, but it, it is really just that simple. Um, and it is the hardest work to do because we've never really done it in a way that we have, you know, that we our life depends on it. Um, but I, I believe that that's just what it's going to have to be. Well, thank you, Paula. I think that's um, a great spot to end the panel. We could kind of, I could talk about buildings and energy efficiency all day. But unfortunately, we have other panels to get to and other infrastructure investments to get into. So Paula, Jason, Kurt, and Jeannie, thank you so much for being fantastic panelists today. Really appreciate hearing all your perspectives. Um, as we transition uh, away from this panel, just a quick thing. Uh, if you watch our EESI briefings, you know I love to plug things that we do. So Jeannie mentioned the Business Council's fact book. We did a briefing with them earlier in the spring about the fact book. It's a great way to learn all about it. In fact, Vincent, one of your coworkers, uh, uh, Paula Vincent Barnes, was on one of those panels, or that panel. It's a great resource. Um, also, we've talked a lot about um, um, you know, these briefings and the event today. And Well, if you want to stay up to date with everything we do at ESI, there is one way to do it that's better than any other way, and that is to sign up for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. And you can do that by visiting us online at www.esi.org. And if you think you're getting too many emails from me, well, first of all, it's not me. It just looks like it's coming from me. But you can manage your subscriptions online, too, and really hone in on what, if it's briefings or fact books or fact sheets or issue briefs or press releases, anything like that. We have a lot of great resources that hopefully help uh, educate policymakers about all the important work that our panelists just said has to get done. So we'll go ahead and wrap it there. We have about a 15-minute interlude while we'll hear uh, from some of our additional remarks from our co-sponsor or our honorary co-sponsors for today. And then we'll convene at 3 o'clock to talk about transportation, which I can see our panelists in the back of the room, and I can't wait. So we'll go ahead and wrap there. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Chris Van Hollen, and I'm proud to represent Maryland in the United States Senate. And I'm especially pleased to be joining all of you once again at the Environmental and Energy Study Institute for our annual Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. Each year, this gathering brings together leaders from all over the country to discuss the urgent need to deploy renewable energy and energy efficiency solutions to confront the accelerating harm caused by emissions of greenhouse gases. Every day we witness new evidence of just how dire the situation is and the high costs of our grossly inadequate response to climate change. But I've long argued, and so have many of you, that rather than focus solely on the costs of inaction, we should also emphasize the huge opportunities for action. Opportunities to build a stronger economy and generate millions of new, homegrown, good paying jobs that put Americans to work addressing this crisis and importantly, reducing the costs of energy consumption for consumers. America's energy efficiency workforce is already the biggest energy workforce in the nation. And we need to build on that momentum to expand it further and faster and make it more robust than ever before. With your help, Congress took an important step forward to do that by passing the Infrastructure Modernization Bill signed by President Biden. That new law funds important programs designed to mobilize our energy efficiency workforce and make homes, businesses, and communities more energy efficient. In the Senate, I'm working to build on that progress with legislative solutions that put more Americans to work while also helping save Americans' money and protect our planet for generations to come. I'm pleased to report that the legislation I introduced, the Hope for Homes Act, achieves all three of these goals. That bill includes historic federal investments to train more Americans to install clean energy and energy efficiency solutions in people's homes by establishing new grants for online workforce training. With these grants, 
contractors and small businesses would be able to more easily train their employees to conduct comprehensive home energy efficiency retrofits. In addition, our bill would give, fam would give families more incentives to make use of energy efficient solutions in their homes, driving down the costs of energy and easing the squeeze on bank accounts and pocketbooks. It's a win, win, win. More Americans in good paying jobs, more homeowners saving money on their energy bills, and less of the polluting emissions that cause climate change. That effort goes hand in hand with my push to create a national clean energy and sustainability accelerator, which scales up the local green bank model we've seen in Maryland and a number of other states and localities around the country. A national accelerator would be a magnet attracting even more private investment in clean energy technologies, spur economic growth, and create new jobs in the process. These two legislative priorities will help build on the important progress we're making right now through the enactment of the infrastructure modernization law. I'm committed to getting both of these bills and others across the finish line so we can support and build up a 21st century workforce that promotes economic growth and fights back against climate change. The bottom line is that investments in clean energy present a huge opportunity for American workers, our economy, and our country. And if we're not leading this effort, we will be left behind by our global competitors. So we must enact additional measures to achieve our goals. And I'm proud to partner with all of you in pursuit of this shared mission. You are the ones on the front lines converting ideas into action, concepts into products. Thanks for all you do to make that happen. Take care. All right. Well, we will convene our third panel of the day, the 2022 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum. We've already covered energy system modernization. We were just talking about buildings and workforce. Now we're going to talk about transportation. Uh, and there's a lot in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act about transportation. And then our fourth panel uh, will have, uh, will end at uh, 345, and then our fourth panel will start at 4 o'clock, and we'll talk about national security and energy security in particular. So a really great session as well. Um, I'm Dan Bursett. I'm with the Environmental Energy Study Institute. Um, I'm joined by many of my colleagues. This is probably a good moment to just say thanks to them. We've got Miguel up here helping us keep time. Uh, I see Savannah. She's helping us with questions. Jeff's in charge of name plates today. Omri is just doing everything. Uh, he's like, you know, a cartoon octopus uh, bartender in a, in a Roger Rabbit or something. Uh, all sorts of great stuff. We've got Troy, our videographer, making sure we look and sound great online. I see Molly. I see Allison. I see all sorts of uh, folks out in the hall, too, Anna and others. So thanks to everybody who's helped us pull together today. Uh, it's been great to be back in person and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, we have an in-person audience here in the Dirksen building. If you have questions, you can catch the attention of my colleague, Savannah. She has index cards and pens, and you can send questions up that way. If you're in our online audience, and there are several hundred of you in our online audience today, uh, you can send us questions. You can follow us on Twitter at EESI Online. You can also send us an email, ask, EESI, ask at EESI.org. That's A-S-K at EESI.org, and we'll do our best to incorporate your questions into the conversation. But without further ado, um, we have four fantastic panelists here today to talk with us about transportation, and specifically transportation investments provided on a bipartisan basis in the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. And our first panelist is Carl Simon. Carl is Director, Transportation and Climate Division, Office of Transportation and Air Quality at the Environmental Protection Agency. He's kicking off our panel today. So Carl, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Dan, and really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and your, your colleagues, as well as the, uh, the audience you have here, too, because this is a, uh, this is, I think, um, I don't think I'm overstating the, uh, the, this, this characterization, is that this is a transformational uh, set of investments that, that Congress has, has given us here, uh, especially in the transportation space here, too, and I'll talk a little bit about this as we go forward. But from, a, from an EPA perspective, I'm going to focus in on the clean school bus portion of the IIJA, but there are other portions of the, 
of that bill that clearly have impact on the transportation sector writ large. So thinking about the, the NEVI program that DOT is, is running in terms of electric vehicle charging infrastructure across the nation's highways and, and other areas too, because that is not just um, accessible for cars. You think about there's, uh, there's money that DOT got in terms of clean ports and looking about what you can do for ports. And as we all know from the supply chain challenges we've had over the last few years, uh, port work is very important as a, this is a foundational um, part of our economy as well too. And there's lots of really interesting technologies and choices there to make to make that, that portion cleaner. Um, and then the other one that's maybe, you know, you may not initially think about as a transportation question, but uh, it's worth paying attention to, and I won't go into too many details, but just the uh, Department of Energy is, uh, has started a, a pretty large set of investments on hydrogen. So they're, they're in the process of looking at hydrogen hubs, they're trying to do a clean hydrogen standard under the provisions of the requirements. You know, hydrogen is talked about as a future fuel. Lots of questions still, um, but that is uh, one again that I think as the as these investment dollars roll out into the economy and as technologies start to get uh, sorted out, something to pay attention to. But let me let me turn to the school bus program because um, that is uh, a got us super excited at EPA to be able to implement. But it is uh, I think for for the reasons I'll, I'll briefly share here. Uh, a transformational program as well, too. So we're talking about $5 billion came from Congress to implement a clean school bus program. As a, as a, just as a, a year ago uh, comparison, EPA's total budget was about 11. So, you know, and EPA got a whole bunch of money otherwise to implement parts of IAJA. So it is a, uh, a scale of investment that the agency has never seen before. Um, Congress is very clear in the requirements. So they built on our successful Diesel Emission Reductions Act program, but it's different. So we, we want to make sure that as we've been implementing this, we're, we're consistent with the new direction Congress gave us to think about uh, how that program gets implemented. But certainly the things we've learned over the last decade plus, working with our stakeholders on implementation is relevant, and as we've figured that out. Uh, there are new priorities and considerations, so there are parties that Congress asks us to think about in terms of uh, high priority school districts, tribal areas, and rural areas that get prioritization in funding. And then there's also considerations that we're supposed to take into account that are different than what we've seen before, including thinking about bringing technologies to cost parity, um, which is an interesting public policy question to sort through, as you could probably imagine. Um, as we think about this, the other aspect here that's gotten, um, as we get done rollout on implementation, is uh, this is a question of replacement. Replacement is used a couple of places in the statute. Uh, replacement, in our mind, and we think it's very important for both air quality and environmental justice reasons, is replacing older buses with cleaner new buses. And the technologies can be um, hydrogen, biofuels, propane, natural gas, and electric, or I think are the ones listed in the statute. We're funding three of them roughly there. Um, but replacement's important because it really does drive, I think, a lot of the change that we're looking for here. Uh, we started a rebate program uh, back in May. It's the first of, uh, the, we're gonna do a grants program later in the fall, and we're gonna try to do two more funding streams a year. So allocating funding out in, in various portions that we think will help address different school districts because right now there's about 500,000 school buses in use at any one time and there's I think over 13,000 school districts. So the rebate program was designed to be fast, easy and accessible, um, but it doesn't work for everybody. We've had great response so far in terms of the applications. We're not done yet. It closes on August 19th. So those of you that are watching that are still thinking about it, you have some time, but not a lot of time. Uh, the other um, provisions to think through here that we'll be working with stakeholders on, including our federal partners, is uh, Buy America provisions are in the, in the bill. So we want to think through what that looks like for especially for charging infrastructure. We need to kind of think through that and Department of Energy and Department of Transportation have the same challenges as well too. Um, and then also thinking about kind of the long-term role is how do we uh, further integrate in our utilities and um, thinking about 
opportunities for other schools to participate. And then the, the last one is, is that $5 billion is an awful lot of money, but it's, it only would replace a portion of the school district uh, buses. So at the end of when the last federal dollar goes out, we would love to have, and we are going to be thinking about designs, to have a sustainable market so that uh, the bus, co bus costs come down and those choices for electric buses, for example, which are very pricey at the moment, are not as hard a decision for school districts to think through. So that's our overview. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. That was great. Our second panelist is Genevieve Cullen. Genevieve is president of the Electric Drive Transportation Association. Hi, Genevieve. Hi. Thanks for having me, Daniel. Um, I think that's it. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Uh, um, thanks to EESI for, for um, having a history of putting together really informative uh, panels with great points of view and happy to be part of it. Um, uh, so for my part of this, uh, I'm here to talk about electric transportation. Um, no surprise, with the Electric Drive <laughs> Transportation Association, we are a cross-industry trade association. Our members represent the value chain of electric transportation. So that it's vehicles, it's utilities, it's components and materials manufacturers and folks in the infrastructure space. And by electric transportation, I mean anything in which electricity moves the wheels. So that's, it's, it's plug-ins, it's hybrids, it's battery electric and fuel cell vehicles, and it's everything from motorcycles to 18-wheelers. So there's uh, all the diverse needs of transportation and how electricity can serve to make those more efficient. Uh, we work with our members to invest in technology, grow markets, and build a policy atmosphere that accelerates a transition to e-mobility, because that's where the market's going. And for us, so what's, what's the measure of our success? Um, well, I'm going to just give you a market snapshot. So in, in 2010, there were two plug-in cars on the road, and the Leaf and the Volt. Uh, now there are 70 models that you can buy at all different price points. Uh, there are... Um, the total, I think, um, Q3 numbers are still just trickling in, but it's about 2.7 million cumulative plug-in vehicles. And at the same time, there is a growing investment in the infrastructure that will, will charge them. So 49,000 public stations, which translates into about 123,000 ports, right? Um, uh, this is great progress. So gone to from you know one percent of new car sales to two, and over the last uh, between 2020 and 2021, the market grew over a hundred uh, year over year over a hundred percent. And uh, so uh, share of market and uh, roughly about five percent of new car sales, which is pretty amazing, right? Um, but um, if you look around the world, you see uh, in Europe, uh, EVs are 10% of new car sales. In China, they are 20%. So this is a robust and growing market, and all the supply chains that go with it are also growing, but we got a lot of work to do. Um, for instance, the, the U.S. car park is maybe 2.7 million vehicles. So we are just... To, uh, 270 million vehicles, and we are 2.7 of that. So we've got some work to do, particularly as the administration is pointing to a goal of 50% of new car sales being uh, electric by 2030. So things, uh, things need to move. And I guess one of the reasons I, I, I'd like to sort of just take a second and tag up on, like, why does it matter, right? Uh, maybe it's a given to lots of people, but... I think it's really important to note, in addition to the fact that because transportation is the largest source of emissions, you can't get after uh, climate change goals or even air pollution goals without addressing the transportation's um, emissions. And electrification is an essential piece of that strategy. So for us, um, and I think and UCS has just released its, uh, its most recent rundown 
of like, how is it better? You know, the forever, I tell you, I had a cousin who asked me last weekend, right? Aren't you just trading emissions from one place to another, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're plugging into coal. The fact is, no matter where you charge your car in the United States, it's cleaner than the average, uh, than the average gasoline-powered vehicle. So this is, um, it's, it's an effective, efficient pathway, and it just gets more, uh, it just gets cleaner as the grid gets cleaner. So um, it's an important tool. It's also a, a global economic opportunity that if we don't invest, we will just be, we'll just be buying from the market as opposed to leading it. Um, a big part of this, it's the bipartisan infrastructure law. Of everybody know the NEVI program has $7.5 billion, um, much of it directed, but not entirely, at, at electric infrastructure. That will seed the market, and it will accelerate private investment, and that's what, that's what my folks are doing. Um, um, but in addition, uh, as, all, you know, as, as Carl said, there's a lot of other diverse pathways for this money in ports for medium and heavy duty, for school buses, and all the diverse ways that we need to get after cleaner transportation. Um, and finally, of course, because I'm a lobbyist and it's my job, there is more we have to do. This is just the beginning of this. We, you know, if we are going to do this transition, we're going to have to transition the whole supply chain. So lots of policy work to be done. Um, and on the industry side, lots of investment to be made. So that's it. Did I hit the number? Gold star for Genevieve, um, and for Carl, too. Um, our third panelist is Chris Bliley. Chris is Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs with Growth Energy. I think that worked. Uh, thanks, Dan, uh, and thanks to my fellow panelists. Nice to finally meet everybody in person. Uh, Carl, I've known for a while, though, <laughs> certainly. Um, and glad to be here today and join you all. Um, I'm actually going to maybe start where, where Genevieve ended. Um, if your goal is to get to net zero, um, it's going to take a variety of technologies, and you can't get there uh, to, without biofuels. Um, we represent 89 biorefineries across the U.S. who produce, as an industry, we produced 15 billion gallons of biofuel last year, a uh, capacity to produce 17 and a half billion gallons annually. Um, today, we are more than 10 percent of the gasoline supply and poised to do much, much more. We are virtually in every gallon of gasoline you see today as 10% ethanol. We have sell E85 and E30 in more than 5,000 locations across the U.S. And E15, which is approved for all 2001 and newer light-duty vehicles, is sold at more than 2,700 locations today. Um, they're you know, closing in on 130, 150,000 fueling locations across the U.S., so we clearly have more work to do as well uh, to get higher blends into the marketplace. Uh, but just yesterday, I drove up from Winston-Salem um, and passed several locations selling E15 and E85. E15 is selling 50 cents less per gallon, uh, and E85 is selling a dollar less per gallon. So at a time, you know, when we're addressing gasoline costs, energy security, as well as the environment, you know, biofuels are really a triple win. Um, they're providing good paying jobs here in the U.S., supporting more than 400,000 jobs. They're reducing consumer costs. Uh, they're lowering greenhouse gas emissions nearly 50 percent compared to gasoline, as well as some other air quality improvements. Uh, and we're giving, uh, you know, American farmers a good source of, of um, a good source market for their grain as well. Um, you know, and I, it, we just talked, I focused mainly on the light duty fleet, but, it, you know, our producers are also very interested and have committed more than a billion gallons into the sustainable aviation fuel market, which is certainly an exciting marketplace, I know, for a number of people. Uh, you know, it's a tremendous market just in general for fuel, and so the more, you know, sustainable aviation fuel we can produce, the, the better we can get at reducing greenhouse gas emissions in those sectors as well. And we're also looking at marine options, um, but, you know, I think as, as Genevieve and others have talked about, we have a lot more to do on the policy front, and really for us as producers, it's about policy certainty. Uh, we have the renewable fuel standard. Uh, which has been in place for more than a decade now, but we need to do, you know, we need to continue that forward to provide growth to the biofuel sector. 
Uh, we also, a number of things pending in Congress on the tax and investment side, as far as infrastructure, as, as well as sort of policy certainty on production of next generation fuels and lower carbon biofuels. So I know we have a number of questions, so I'll pause there, but looking forward to the discussion. That was great, Chris. Thank you so much. Our fourth panelist is Art Gazzetti. Art is the Vice President, Mobility Initiatives and Public Policy at the American Public Transportation Association. Welcome, Art. Take it away. Join my, uh, thank you, Daniel. I'll join my fellow panelists in commending EESI for pulling the great information together that it does and bringing it here, bringing it right to Capitol Hill where it, you know, it means, means a lot. Um, I'm going to uh, state that, um, you know, moving forward, we're going to need, uh, you know, our energy efficiency is going to require more and better public transportation. Um, you know, we're, transportation is the, the leading sector of all sectors for emissions. Now, that's not to say we're number one. We're number one. That means that we have the most room for improvement, right? And there's, uh, that, that's the greatest opportunity uh, for improvement. Uh, I will say that um, uh, transit was, we, uh, transit workers were among the heroes and sheroes of the pandemic, never shut down, uh, took essential workers to their jobs, the hospitals, cities, uh, uh, kept hospitals going, kept cities going, uh, kept communities functioning. And uh, for that, you know, I think uh, going forward, we're going to be there as underscored by the bipartisan infrastructure law to have a, a big role uh, in our uh, policy future. Uh, the key is to give good choices uh, to, to the public. And it's, you know, it's good to have a car. It's good to have, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a road network. But you shouldn't have to use that road network or your car for everything, for every trip. You shouldn't have to burn a gallon of gas to get a quart of milk. We need a balanced system that has those energy efficient uh, 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 choices. I will also say that uh, public transit providers across the country have been early adopters for sustainability. We embrace sustainability in all its ways from the buildings and facilities we use to the, the transit providers, to the vehicles they operate, to the fuels that power uh, their operations. Um, to the, uh, the you know, extending to things like water, recycle, uh, waste disposal, uh, et cetera. Uh, I will also say that public transportation and land use go hand in hand. Always have, always will, and the communities that are built are ba built on the foundation of the transportation uh, system that's in place. Public uh, uh, communities built on the foundation of public transportation are inherently energy efficient. And when you crunch the numbers, that's what's going to uh, show up. With regard to the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, what's key there is the, you know, what, what makes it a historic bill. There's, first of all, there's enough funds to make a difference. We're just not keeping up with state of good repair needs. If we make the right choices, we can make it a transformational uh, bill. There are provisions in it for uh, low and no emissions buses. Um, there's discretionary grant programs that are steered towards policy outcomes, such as uh, access to opportunity, emissions reduction, favorable environmental outcomes. That's going to give communities, regions, the opportunity to make the choice for energy efficient uh, uh, policies going forward. Um, I'll pause there, and I know there's much more, uh, much more to talk about. Thanks, Art. And there is. There's so much to talk about, and there's, it's really, the transportation sector is really exciting uh, with uh, the amount of transformation that has to take place and all of the different technologies and sectors and um, um, things that are coming together. Um, Carl, I'd like to, I'll start with you, and then I'd love to hear from the rest of the panel as well. You talked about electric school buses, talked about NEVI. Um, from a decarbonization perspective, help us understand a little bit about sort of what the potential decarbonization benefits will look like from either those provisions or other provisions of IIJA that you're especially excited about, whether they're at EPA or perhaps being undertaken by one of the other agencies. Sure. Um, I think I touched briefly on it a bit uh, in my opening remarks, but it's just the, this, this transformational investment that we're making as a, as a country in these 
sectors. Now, there's been, you know, Genevieve talked about the history of this and how we've gone, and I would agree that the trend lines are certainly very positive in terms of where you see market growth. And Chris has talked about the Renewable Fuels Program, and you see a lot of growth there as well, too. Um, thinking about where you, what, what is it that you need to kind of get past to the kind of the, you know, economic tipping point it doesn't need to be 70% of the market. It needs to be 20 or 30%. You know, there, there's places where it becomes routine, where businesses are making investments, where it's, it's giving choices. I like Art's statement about providing choices to consumers. Those are the things you want to provide people with so that, so that it's not necessarily being driven by one, one specific policy or a tax incentive or something else, but it's, 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 uh, kind of common nature. And if you think about the transportation sector, even in the last 15 years, think about what we were doing 15 years ago and think about what 10 years could be. I mean, there's, there's a lot of change that's coming here. And this, op, this, this funding stream, so for school buses, is your, if you're doing domestic production, you're, you're bringing battery production on, on site into this country more so because it's a, it's a sustainable market. You're providing market signals over, we're going to spend $5 billion over the next five years. Whether, you know, how that goes out is a whole separate question, but that's going into the school bus sector. That's our goal is to get as much dollars into the bus sector as we possibly can. So building on that structure that allows for market investment, that allows for some certainty. And I think you could go down the line in other parts of IAJA that just allow for that stream of um, consistency. Genevieve, from your perspective, sort of what do we need to do to ensure that these infrastructure jobs, infrastructure investment jobs act investments are as impactful as possible for your, your members? Wonky. It's, yeah, and it's hard Sorry. to see. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think there's a, a, there's a, as always, there's a couple of pieces in play here, right? We have to create enough flexibility in the movement of this money because transportation is diverse and communities are diverse and how they consume transportation varies. So you need programs built to serve all these different drivers and communities. And um, we, you know, would a rural school district and a Manhattan one need in a school bus are different things, right? And different infrastructure to serve them. And how do you get all the stakeholders together? Um, so I think that flexibility in what is is really important. And uh, I think uh, Carl's point about seeding this market is so important. And you know, you know the ATVM program is also part of this. And they're just they announced today. Um, underwriting uh, battery production in the United States and um, you know supply chains follow markets so we build a market here where the supply chain comes closer and um, we get economies of scale and reduction in costs and this is how you actually get to that the inflection point that people keep calling for. Chris, for, from your perspective at Growth Energy, what are the provisions of the IAJA that you think could be most impactful for um, getting more biofuels into the market? Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll talk a little more broadly than, uh, I mean, I think I, I touched a little bit on the renewable fuels program. Um, these infrastructure investments is, is, again, I think as long as you're hitting multiple technologies, the ability for biofuels to compete, um, you know, we talk about vehicles, we have 245, at least 245 million vehicles on the road today that can use E15, uh, but we only have it in 2,600 locations. So the more we can develop infrastructure and get E15 available to consumers to give them the con choice at, at the pump or choice wherever of technologies, I think is key. I think you know further development of efficient efficient engines. Uh, you know that's high octane, low carbon. Uh, mid-level ethanol blends in a, in a sort of a future technology engine uh, can drive even, you know, even further greenhouse gas reductions alongside electrification and other technologies. Um, you know, there's the Next Generation Fuels Act that has a lot of development of sort of this octane piece and low carbon piece. Um, but again, I think it's, you know, giving people con choices today with available infrastructure, additional infrastructure investments, and then, you know, key incentives and key investments in sort of new and emerging technologies like sustainable aviation fuel and marine fuels. Thanks. And Art, let's give you the last word. Where do you see the potential for, for greatest impact from the infrastructure bill investments? Okay, I'm going to break that down into, uh, you know, bus and rail. 
Uh, first of all, on the rail side, as uh, we talk about the historic dimensions, there's the public transportation elements, and married to that are the passenger rail. You know, just a, uh, a, a, a huge commitment in really taking our passenger rail network uh, to a whole new level. Uh, so I'll, I'll mention that in, in those words. On the bus side, uh, first of all, the transition is remarkable. In 1995, uh, 5%, uh, uh, only 95% of the buses were diesel. Uh, in 2018, my stats are a little old, uh, it's, it, it, the diesel was only 40%. So from 95 it went down to 40, and it's you, know, you take that forward. It's 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 only shrunk. The, the non-diesel is is risen a lot. So we're already on that track, and it's going to eventually be you know we're committed to zero uh, zero emission, right? So that's the that's the track we're on, and we already have made huge progress. The bipartisan infrastructure bill will take that project that uh, process further. I'll also mention. It's not easy. The transition of a bus fleet to, uh, say, from diesel to electric um, comes, with, comes with issues. You have to, um, you need the charging facilities, you need the power deals with your electric, electric utility, you need the, the fleets of buses, and you know, in this time where a lot of people are ordering, how you keep up with those orders. Uh, you need the operations plan. You don't operate a electric bus the same way you operate other buses. I could go into that in, the, in detail. Uh, and of course, the worker training um, as well. So we, uh, you know, as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, many transit agencies are developing transition plans. Uh, they're fully into that, but we have the resources to certainly make a, a big dent. Thanks. Um, we just got a question from the audience that I think is pretty interesting, and I'm going to, I'll ask it, but I'll ask our, or I'll offer our panelists an opportunity to broaden it out a little bit. Uh, and the question is um, specifically about EV charging, but it's what is in the bipartisan infrastructure law that will increase adoption of EV charging from on-site renewable generation? And I'm curious, um, I'll open it up to anyone who'd like to answer. I'm, I'm curious what your answer is to that question, but more broadly, how does the transportation sector work with some of the other sectors of the economy? I'm thinking particular building sectors, generation sector, but also the agriculture sector, Chris. I'm curious what you're thinking about that. And if you'd like to start with you, Chris, we'll, and you can go f uh, ahead, and then we'll open it up to anyone else. Yeah, no, I mean, we, I, that's a really, that's a great question as, as it pertains to additional sectors. So in a lot of markets, particularly on the West Coast, we have low carbon fuel standards. So the transportation sector is required to reduce the carbon intensity of the fuel they use. Um, on paper, it's fuel agnostic. So whether it's electric or whether it's biofuels or what have you, you're competing just as long as you lower that carbon intensity. And for us as biofuel producers, a good portion of our production is from agriculture. So we are working hand in hand with farmers on you know on the farm uh, reductions in things that reduce greenhouse gas emissions things like cover crops um, you know precision agriculture uh, additional yields um, as as well as the power sector uh, we have a number of plants that are looking at ways to you know use renewable electricity uh, or reuse things if they can recycle things sort of on the water or power side um, a number of our plants are co-located with uh, power companies, so they use process heat. Um, and so really taking advantage of, frankly, things that are seeking to lower greenhouse gas emissions or become more energy efficient in either, you know, energy agriculture as well as, you know, just on the fuel production side. We're also working certainly with the automakers um, as they look at engine efficiency. And if you can use a higher octane fuel. Uh, for those who don't know, ethanol is among the highest octane components in the world. So if you use a high octane fuel in conjunction with a more efficient engine, uh, you can significantly improve engine efficiency as well as get the benefits of you using a homegrown renewable fuel. Other panelists, whether you'd like to riff on what Chris said or uh, other thoughts about what's in the infrastructure bill for, you know, uh, combining transportation electrification with on-site generation? I think it's, it's the right question about how do we thoughtfully um, 
serve a lot of different fueling, charging needs. And there is, specific to the question, there are investments in energy storage and in grid resiliency that all speak to sort of creating um, charging facilities that can be served by distributed generation of, of any variety, but primarily renewable, but also th through battery storage. And utilities working with infrastructure developers, working with the folks in the, the truck stop operators are designing the solutions that serve their customers. Um, yeah, I'll just, yeah, I'd look at that question in through the lens of resiliency, right? If we're going to move uh, to electric, we have to make sure uh, we're prepared when, if maybe the electric goes out, right? And so many transit systems, uh, New Jersey Transit is one that comes to mind, but there are others that are investing in their own microgrids uh, to make sure they have, call it alternate power, they have an alternative source, uh, you know, to, to be resilient in the event of energy uh, happenings. Carl? Yeah, those are all great and relevant uh, responses, I think, and I'm, I fully support my, my panelists here. I think just from a school bus perspective, we are uh, very interested in thinking about what the distributed uh, charging network can look like, because right now demand charges in the utility sector for electric buses and cars are really expensive. So if there's technology solutions there, but it also thinks, you know, it may be a solution for a rural school district that is looking to have a significant amount of electric buses in their space, but to run a power line miles and put in a substation could be cost prohibitive. So I really do think the opportunity for people to be creative to find solutions that work for them in this space is, uh, is really important. And we're seeing even interest, you know, over just the few, first few months of this program, we're getting a lot of interest in some of those things like battery storage or solar generation. Great, thanks. And thanks to everyone in our online audience. It's a significant online audience today, so thanks for sending in the questions. That It's great. Um, I've asked this question to our other panels. Um, our first panelist of the day was Kelly Speaks Backman, and she was, the, she, she was the first person to get this. But I'm, I'd like to ask this panel as well. And Genevieve, maybe we'll start with you, and we'll go through the panel, and we'll give Carl the last word here. But what's your vision for the transportation sector in 2030? Where do you see the trends going? Where do you see the most opportunities for catching up? and getting the transportation sector on track to deliver the kinds of emissions reductions we need to meet our 2030 goals? Um, that's a big question, so I could, spill up a, I could fill up a lot of space, but I'll, I'll, keep, it, I'll keep it direct. Um, the first trend that's worth noticing, and in between now and 2030, as Carl said, is this conversation is so very dominated by the passenger vehicle market, and rightly so, because there are so many. But we have to address medium and heavy duty as well. And there is enormous growth in that segment. It's starting from a smaller baseline, but that has the potential to make a real difference. So the investments that are made now are going to transform the commercial market, and that's an important piece. On the passenger side of this, that's 70 models that are available today. That'll be 100 models in three years. And that is just an exponentially fast growth in the choices for consumers, and that's going to change the commercial market, I mean, the passenger side of the market. Uh, and I think on the supply chain piece of this, because that uh, the, the, the retail side of the marketplace and even government purchasers and, and all the, through procurement, those market drivers are also creating enormous investment in that supply chain, and that's going to drive down costs and actually speed up uh, adoption in the United States and globally. So I think, um, again, I, I, um, I'm sure everyone is tired of that term, inflection point, but this is it. And if, uh, if, we, if Carl does his job right, <laughs> we, um, this is, and, and, and everyone in government who is moving this historic amount of money um, is, is able to do that, then um, we, we can actually realize that. Chris, let's go to you next. What's your vision for 2030? Yeah, no, thanks. I think for us, I, I, again, I, I think there's going to be room for a lot of different technologies, but I don't think we can ignore sort of some of the immediacy of things we can do here in the next eight years. Um, you know, E15 is available today. Uh, anybody who has a 2001 and newer car can use it. Uh, if we move to an E15 nationwide, which we certainly hope would happen by 2030, 
Uh, that's 17, 17 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions, the equivalent of taking 4 million cars off the road every year. Um, and that's, like I said, you can go to Sheets today and pull the pump today. It's not, you know, it can, it, it, it's, can be used in a number of stations already without significant infrastructure investments. Yeah. Additionally, there are 20 million uh, flex fuel vehicles today that can use up to E85, mm. uh, which drives even further greenhouse gas emissions. I think looking towards 2030, and I talked about the Next Generation Fuels Act, but there's just been a lot of discussion around high-octane fuels and, and really um, efficient engines uh, into the future, and those can drive even further greenhouse gas emission reductions. And then I think, you know, as we talked about earlier, it is expansion beyond sort of the light duty fleet. Um, you know, we have a number of producers who've committed gallons for the sustainable aviation market, um, and that's a 20 billion gallon a year market, just in aviation fuel, fuel here in the U.S., and, and much bigger than that globally. Uh, marine fuels, I think I saw something just on, my, on the way here. It wasn't ethanol specific, but it was biofuel related in the use of uh, in marine fuel. Um, and then, you know, we certainly have biodiesel, renewable diesel, and, and even ethanol um, uh, technologies into the heavy-duty sort of trucking market as well. And so, you know, for us, it's really uptake of higher ethanol blends. Uh, it's expanding into some of those hard-to-electrify sectors as well. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the higher blends, it's not just E15 today, it's E85 and the FFVs, as well as E30 and future engines. Art, from your perspective? Yeah. <clears throat> My organization, the American Public Transportation Association, roots go back to 1882. 1882, we were talking about horse-drawn streetcars. That predates the internal combustion engine. Uh, the point in that is transportation is ever-evolving. Transportation policy is ever-evolving. A lot of the travel patterns, uh, uh, travel behavior, they're, they're not yet settled in yet. Uh, we'll come back, we'll come back differently. But what we're going to need is good choices. Uh, if it's a choice of a, you know, of, a, of, a, of a bus every 45 minutes, you're, you're not going to get uh, other than people who are you know, totally dependent uh, on that trip. We want to provide, serve the, serve the uh, public with frequent service, with uh, reliable service, service comfortable to them, um, and yeah, you know, we'll we'll come back in a good way. And Carl, this gives you the last word on the 2030 question. Yeah, it's Genevieve. If only it were that simple that I could <laughs> make it so. Um, uh, again, I like the the responses from my from my panelists colleagues here. Um, so 2030 is not that long from now, right? And especially in the transportation space, it's we have production cycles that people are looking at. 2025, 2026 model year vehicles probably already, so they're making decisions. So uh, I think that for 2030 is a, I think it's a great check-in point, but it's also a good target for getting at all of the things that we've talked about here over the last half an hour or so in terms of there are opportunities for uh, significant advancement in, in moving towards our net zero target. So if you want to say 2050 for net zero, in each sector of the transportation thing. So Chris has talked a lot about SAF. It's a really important sector to make progress in. Marine, highway truck, you know, applications, marine uh, construction equipment. There are lots of things out there that we can, as a society, make choices on. And there are technologies out there. We, we know that they're up there. I think that thinking about uh, for, for, so seeing significant progress Seeing the U.S. maintain its leader, technology leadership role in, in this space, I think, is really important for both uh, for, for the country, but also for jobs and um, just uh, public acceptance will be really important. Consumers, 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 because we can have great policies, but if they don't work, um, you know, if you can't get them up in the uptake in the market, because we're not talking about um, a couple of percent uptake here and there of anything we've talked about here. It is lots of uptake of these new technologies, lots of change coming to the transportation sector in this time frame. So really keeping a really laser focus on how you not just find the technologies at work, drive the cost down, but also make sure that people understand it and they have these choices that they can make and that we're meeting them halfway because the, the demand side of the equation, we do a really great job in this country in terms of 
technology and cleaner fuels and tax incentives, demand side's been a little harder public policy not to crack over the years um, when you look at kind of just overall. So really that focus, I think, Daniel, would be uh, one that I would hope that we can make a collective um, movement together on to just so that it's, it's sustainable. So we have, uh, my colleague Savannah is on question duty today, and we've gotten a lot of questions coming in from our online audience. We're not going to get to all of them, unfortunately. We're about out of time. Um, but we'll talk with our panelists. Perhaps we can follow up individually. So if you're sending us questions online, we're not ignoring you. We'll, we may just have to address them in a different way. Um, I'd like to wrap with the last two or so minutes that we have on the panel today. We'll make this a lightning round, and we can start with whoever would like to go first. Maybe we'll let Art go first this time. But what's on the, what are some of the major advancements on the horizon in the transportation sector that give you the most optimism for, about our ability to decarbonize? Yeah, the, the, the way I'd answer that is commitment, not just commitment of, uh, uh, is, uh, I, I would answer that with one word, commitment. I know that the transit agencies are uh, you know, determined to make the, their own operations more sustainable because in so doing that will uh, you know, that will uh, incentivize regions to embrace transportation that's already as clean and efficient as it can be itself uh, as part of the uh, core solution for regional efficiency and sustainability strategies. Um, Chris, Genevieve, Carl, please feel free to chime in. Try and go with one word answer. I mean, I think for us it's diversification, really. I mean, we are certainly higher uh, biofuel blends are important moving forward uh but diversification into some of these hard to electrify sectors into th and we talked just about transportation on this panel but you know our our biorefineries are really looking at you know we produce animal feed we're looking at things like biochemicals bioplastics so really it's about diversification um just you know policy certainty uh and our continued investment in, into uh you know reducing greenhouse gas emissions <laughs> Theory of threes, right? So it's three things. Um, in the technology development, batteries are cheaper, performing better. And on the, the charging side, that technology is evolving so quickly. In um, three years ago, when people said fast charge, they meant uh, 150 kW. Now they mean 350 kW. And what that means to the world who doesn't really follow this that much is that's 20 miles per minute of charging. That's game change as far as people's concern about does this car serve my needs. And that goes to the sort of cascading reinforcement that will build that consumer demand and you know, get us to that next step. Uh, I like the battery technology because that does unlock an awful lot of doors uh, across the sectors that we've been talking about. But I will go with uh, car competition because we really are kind of in a golden age of just amazing technologies and, and policy choices that we have in front of us to transform the transportation sector. And uh, seeing kind of all the energy that we, we see from stakeholders that come in to talk to us on a regular basis, I'm optimistic for the future that we, we can make some really great progress in a very short time period. Great. Well, thanks, Carl. Uh, thanks to our fabulous panelists. Thanks to Carl, Genevieve, Chris, and Art for being very insightful and very concise and um, just sharing lots of great information. We've had many of you on similar expo panels in the past and I think one of the things that's really fun about working at ESI is that we get to bring in these different voices representing different parts of the transportation sector and it means a lot to have you all here today to help our audience understand sort of what the challenges and opportunities are. And, and Carl, good luck because we're all counting on you. Um, no pressure. Um, a couple quick things. One is we our next panel, and I can see some of our panelists are here, will be at four. We do have some video remarks are, uh, with Representative Kind that we'll show in just a moment. But a couple things. One, we just did a briefing on EV charger infrastructure build out. It was a great briefing. If you haven't checked it out already, it's, it's really worth your time. It was part of our scaling up innovation to drive down emissions series. Uh, so I definitely recommend that. Also, uh, I mentioned him before, but my colleague Jeff is here. Jeff is our author, or the author, of our Sustainable Aviation Fuels Issue Brief. It is fabulous. It is one of our most popular educational resources. And so we talked a little bit about SAF here today. Check Jeff's work out. Talk to him uh, today. It's, it's really interesting. He's a 
former pilot. He knows about this stuff uh, inside and out. So I uh, just wanted to plug that resource. And then um, as I was going around the room earlier, I didn't see Emma. Emma's in our front row. If I went and didn't thank Emma for everything she did to make today possible, I would never hear the end of it, and I would feel really bad. And I also didn't see Becky. Where's Becky? She's around here. Oh, she's in the hallway. OK. Well, anyway, Becky Blood, a big part of our organizational effort today, too. And I just wanted to say thanks to her. So we'll wrap this panel. Thank you again so much. We'll turn it over to Representative Kind in just a moment uh, on the screen here. And we'll be back at 4 o'clock for energy security. Thanks. Thank thanks. Representative Kind, thank you so much for joining us this year at the 2022 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum. Thank you for your service as co-chair or chair of the House Energy, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. My first question for you today is, why did you choose to become the chair of the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus? And well, what is it about these issues that make you so yeah, Dan, first of all, thanks. This is great that we're able to do this in person. Last year it was virtually because of the COVID, the pandemic and that, so this feels a lot more comfortable <laughs> and a lot more fun too. Yes. But listen, this has been a great caucus, the Renewable Energy and Energy okay. Efficiency Caucus, because it's a great convergence between what you can do with good public policy to try to encourage the right movement in the energy and the efficiency sector, but also what the private sector is already doing. Yeah. And, you know, we had this adverse ruling on EPA oversight uh, with various industries recently, but we just had lunch with Michael Regan, the administrator of the EPA yesterday, and he said, listen, they still have a lot of tools in their toolbox, but more importantly, the private sector is moving in a very positive direction, a lot of forward momentum in the investment in renewable, uh, sustainable energy sources, increased energy efficiency, make sense for their bottom line, great paying jobs being created. I see a lot of this happening in my own largely rural western Wisconsin district. So it's been fun to be a part of that kind of intersection between public and private uh, direction of where we're going with all this and the bipartisan nature uh, of the caucus. I'm proud that we have so many Republican members choosing to participate too. Definitely. A major theme of the 2022 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum is infrastructure and specifically the wide range of investments that Congress provided last year on a bipartisan basis through the Infrastructure Investment Jobs right. Act. What were your priorities in the IIJA and what are you most enthusiastic, enthusiastic to see implemented? Well, obviously the EV charging stations, you know, chicken and egg type of thing. Mm -hmm. And right now the demand for electric vehicles is through the roof with energy prices, uh, uh, gas pump prices right now that people are experiencing. But you need that infrastructure to support it, uh, especially in areas like mine. Again, a large rural area where uh, having those charging stations make it feasible for longer distance travel with EV vehicles. You know, I hate to plug the uh, F-150 specifically, but when the president got behind the wheel and hit it and the type <laughs> of torque and acceleration that you see, it really opened up a lot of eyes, especially in rural America, that yeah, this is a path forward, that they're not going to lose performance while gaining uh, energy efficiency and less cost uh, out of their own pocket. So I have some you know, retailers like Quick Trip in Wisconsin already trying to build out their own type of system, but I think you needed a collective nation nationwide effort in order to establish that EV. The other important feature too that's keyed into energy efficiency is broadband deployment. I mean, you've got smart homes, you've got smart appliances, smart everything. And if you don't have access to high speed internet connection and 5G capability, it's gonna hold a lot of communities a lot of businesses and families back. So there's a lot of investment, obviously, for broadband deployment too. And through a combination of that, along with just basic infrastructure to make sure that we're moving goods and people around much more efficiently so there's less traffic jams, less idling, less needless uh, use of energy, that's gonna go a long ways. In our briefings over the year, we've covered um, climate solutions in farming communities and in the agricultural sector. Um, and there's a lot more that can be done there. And I'm curious from your perspective, coming from a largely rural district in Wisconsin, what are some of the, the things happening in the agricultural sector when it comes to climate solutions that you're really looking forward to seeing sort of uh, deployed on a more widespread basis. This is going to be a really exciting area, uh, especially with the next farm bill just around the corner. There's a lot of work already. I've been involved in these discussions too of having uh, a sustainability chapter of the farm bill. And listen, the farmers back home get it. I mean, they're seeing the extreme weather events right now, extreme drought conditions in certain areas. They need to. They know they need to be much more efficient in water usage. Uh, but also energy expen expenditure. Right now, because of the war in Ukraine, energy prices skyrocketing, huge cost burden uh, on family farmers and rural communities uh, overall. So they're looking for pathways forward. They want to do it. I think if we create the right incentives in the Farm Bill, 
Uh, it's not going to be hard uh, to get more participation. Carbon sequestration programs, for instance, they, they agree with and, and make. We have a lot more no-till going on mm -hmm. in my area. Of course, we have a lot of slope in my area, too, where they're highly erodible areas. So no-till is about the only option you have. And they're embracing these type of steps. I was always a champion on having a beefed up conservation title of the farm bill, so we have good conservation plans on our farmlands. Today we're turning away three out of every four farmers applying for conservation funding assistance because of the inadequacy of funding. Not because of inadequacy of demand, they want it. It's just Congress needs to step up and appropriate the resources to give them the tools uh, what they need. So that's going to be very exciting to see where that happens. But I'm already seeing a lot of the methane digesters back mm -hmm. home with uh, some of the CAFO units, some of the dairy operations. Technology's brought that down to scale now where before it might have taken a few thousand head to make this economically feasible. Now it's a few hundred head. And now they're starting to build out pipes to the farms so, and to eliminate that transportation cost and tapping it into the grid system. So that's an exciting development uh, that we're seeing uh, back home too. But let me just give you one example of a rural community in my district, Cashton. Mm -hmm. Cashton made the investment by partnering with uh, the organic co-op, the largest one in the nation uh, uh, crop, along with Gunnarsson Health Systems to put wind generation uh, in their community. And so they got wind tournaments going. They just partnered with XL Energy to put a huge solar farm in their community. The downtown that they just revamped has a lot of geothermal that they invested in. And this is just a small rural community in western Wisconsin showing how it can be done, creating good paying jobs. If we can do it there, we can do it anywhere. And they're showing the way. There's so much great leadership happening uh, in the agricultural sector uh, when it comes to climate solutions. And we're, we'll be spending a lot of time on that in the next year and a half or so in our briefings. I'd like to follow up on the comment you made about energy prices and certainly inflation and energy prices on e is on everybody's minds um, and specifically energy burdens and for some families energy burdens could be you know three times as much as the national average yeah. um, and oftentimes these energy burdens are worse in rural areas they disproportionately impact frontline communities environmental justice communities communities of color um, what is the potential from your perspective for renewable energy and energy efficiency to help families manage energy costs and provide more uh, disposable income for their other priorities in their lives. Yeah, it's a good point. And what I've been doing is going out and visiting some of the projects we have going back home. We invested some money in the American Rescue Plan for enhanced uh, energy upgrades for people's homes. And these are typically lower income families. The community action programs are the ones contracting out in order to do this energy efficiency upgrades of homes. And I was just visiting one about a month ago in my district, in a rural community again, where they did a revamp with increased uh, uh, insulation, uh, some new windows in it, some new uh, energy efficient appliances. It brought their monthly costs from roughly 400 a month down to a little over 100 bucks. Huge cost savings uh, for all that. And they're going to definitely reap the uh, dividend when Wisconsin winter sets in this fall. And that's just an example of a small upfront investment making a huge difference in that family's life as far as their energy costs. And you bring that to scale. You don't have to be generating more energy. If you can reduce that consumption level down, that goes a long ways of reducing emissions ultimately too. So these programs have, have proven themselves worth every penny. And in my book, I think we ought to be doing more of that. Um. And to do more of that, we need more people employed uh, in the clean energy sector. And in our latest, by our latest count, we come up with about 4 million, maybe more than 4 million people engaged in the clean energy workforce. But I think there's a lot of room to grow considering how much more improvement we have. What are your priorities for strengthening the renewable energy and energy efficiency workforce in Wisconsin and across the country? You know, it's a huge, huge issue right now. We have a tight labor market across the board. I mean, you don't go into a business, large or small, and their number one concern is where are the workers going to come from. I'm proud that I've got a, a technical school system in Wisconsin that recognizes it. They've established programs, especially up in the Chippewa Valley area. Chippewa Valley Tech has a specific program now for skills training and apprenticeship programs for renewable energy jobs in the community. And the demand, again, is through the roof. The companies want that. That, that way they have a steady stream of, of workers coming out of CVTC. And the students uh, are excited because these are generally good paying jobs, too, that punch above their weight. And they see the good that they're doing in the community. So. Um, we're establishing some really neat education models back home in Wisconsin that we can, again, uh, share with the rest of the country so that we're developing that next generation workforce to meet the uh, employment needs. 
Well, it's been very generous of you to spend some time with us today to talk about your priorities for the caucus and priorities for renewable energy and energy efficiency. You've had a very distinguished career in Congress. Uh, and I'm curious, as you look back on your, your role as a champion for agriculture and for clean energy over the years, what are some of your accomplishments that you're most proud of? You know, instead of citing specific legislation uh, that, that I can, uh, I think one of my more uh, important accomplishments, I would phrase, is I've been able to work in a bipartisan fashion. Mm -hmm. It's hard these days. Things are so polarized. It's so hyperpartisan. And making that extra effort, reach across the aisle, get to know your colleagues, establish that trust that's needed in order to work together, and then the ever-elusive common ground. I've consistently been ranked in the top 10 mm -hmm. in the House as far as bipartisan work with the bills that we work, the bills that we get across the finish line and sign into law. We need more of that at all levels of government, whether it's Washington, state, at the local level. People need to start coming together again for common goals and realize the benefit of joining forces to, to get things done instead of this just constant back and forth screaming uh, that's going on. And I think people back home expect that of their legislators, to be grown-ups, get in the same room, talk to each other, find common ground that you work on. And in the renewable energy efficiency area, the policy space, there's so much room for growth and uh, hopefully future Congresses are going to be able to figure it out. Well, great. And I'm hopeful that our policy forum uh, can be an opportunity for that kind of bipartisan discussion about these issues, because there is so much agreement and so much common ground to be had. Thank you so much for talking with us today. It's always a real pleasure to see you. And I'd just like to also thank your staff uh, for helping us uh, yeah, get best. together today. They really are fabulous. And uh, good luck in the remainder of the 117th Congress. And um, I really appreciate you joining us today. Great. For the Thanks, Dan. My pleasure. Forum. Thanks. All right. Well, welcome to uh, the fourth panel of the 2022 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum. Um, we've covered energy system modernization. We've covered buildings. We've covered workforce. We just covered transportation. Now we're going to talk a little bit about energy security. Um, I'm Dan Brissett with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Um, I'd like to take a moment at the beginning of our panel today uh, to just call out the leadership of our uh, honorary co-chairs, honorary co-sponsors for today. Uh, on the Senate side, that's Senators Reed and Crapo, Van Hollen and Collins. And on the House side, you just saw Representative Kind. Uh, thanks to those uh, five members for their um, leadership and their great staff. Uh, for helping us convene the panel today. Um, this is our first panel in over two years in person. Actually, this is the fourth panel in over two years. Um, but it's great to have uh, to be back up here in the Dirksen building, and we couldn't do it without, um, without the, the leadership and support from our um, honorary co-sponsors. So without much ado, uh, we will have some questions, um, or we'll have some Q&A. Uh, for folks in the room, um, there is an option for you to ask questions. You can catch the eye of my colleague, Savannah. She has note cards and pens. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can do it that way. If you're in our online audience, and we have a significant online audience today, uh, you can follow us on Twitter, at EESI Online, uh, and you can also uh, send us an email, and the email address to use is ask at EESI.org. That's A-S-K at EESI.org. And when you're doing that, uh, take a moment to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It's the best way to keep up with everything that we're doing. Oh, I can hear the rain. All right. Um, I'm going to uh, do very brief introductions of our panelists, and then we'll dive right in. And our first panelist is Joseph Bryan. Joe is Chief Sustainability Officer and Senior Advisor for Climate at the U.S. Department of Defense. Joe, thanks for coming back to our expo this year, and uh, turn it over to you. Great. I think... Uh... Thanks, Dan. Well, it's really nice to be here. It's actually nice. It's a bit, it's a bit uh, different to be in person. You know, I have, uh, we, we do a lot of these things, but, uh, but they're, they're not always in person. <laughs> they're le even as, you know, they used to be in person all the time, but I think that, that the shift actually permanently made some of these easier to do, easier to do virtually, so mm -hmm. we're not seeing as much of this. So it's, it's actually nice to see real people in the audience. Um, so real briefly, uh, I think one of the questions posed to all of us, um, or maybe just to me, and uh, uh, before the forum was, or what does all this have to do with national security? What is clean energy? What is energy efficiency? What is solar? What is storage? What does that have to do with national security? Um, and I, so I'm going to speak to that just for a couple minutes, and then I, I look forward to a discussion with my, uh, my co-panelists here. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you guys, and Tim, see you again. Um, and then we can, we can have a discussion with the audience, so I look forward to that. Um, 
So to start with, the primary job of the Department of Defense is to prepare a force uh, that can defend the United States and that can, um, can um, deter conflict, um, but that can also fight and win wars if, if, we are, if we are forced into that situation. So that is our primary mission. And folks sometimes ask, well, what is, what is clean energy? What is uh, sustainability? What, is, um, what does energy efficiency have to do with that mission? And the answer, frankly, is, is quite a lot. Um, and let me give you just a, a few quick examples, and then we can kind of expand on it during the discussion. One, if you think about our military installations, um, they exist out in communities around the country, and they, and they rely almost exclusively on the commercial electric grid for power. And what we know is, what we all know in this room, is that the commercial electric grid's at risk, right? Risk from a couple different uh, threats. One, uh, climate-induced severe weather, from hurricanes to uh, extreme heat, which we're experiencing in real time, to, um, um, to um, wildfires out west, which touch on even on our bases, like Camp Pendleton. Um, we know that the grid is at risk from that, and the, and the department can't, we have missions on our installations that, that, that can't actually um, um, to carry that risk. They need to stay up and running even if the grid goes down. We also have a risk from cyber attack. And if you look at uh, look across the world, we know that um, our critical infrastructure, critical infrastructure around the world, and even in the United States, if you think about things like the Colonial Pipeline attack last year, that our adversaries are interested in targeting our critical infrastructure in order not only to affect us economically, but also affect our ability to mobilize the force we need to do to, we need to, we need to, to, uh, to do our job. So um, the grid's at risk. We rely on the grid. And so how do we mitigate that risk? Well, one of the, a couple of the best ways to mitigate that risk are one, be super efficient, right? Get as efficient as we possibly can so we take pressure off that grid in the first place. We have some great examples where we've actually been able to, to use efficiency and even distributed generation uh, to take our uh, facilities off the grid and relieve pressure on the commercial grid and protect that grid for everyone. So you can, you can actually preserve the grid um, and preserve our own mission by being more efficient. And then distributed generation, uh, solar storage um, can also help uh, inside the fence line, attach to critical missions, can ensure that those functions stay up and running even if you lose the commercial grid. So if the grid goes down and you have a really efficient operation that has battery backup and PV or other renewable energy assets that don't require logistics support or don't require fuel deliveries to an installation, in times of crisis, that can be really important. So in that circumstance, energy efficiency, uh, distributed generation, storage are incredibly well aligned with, of course, um, uh, mitigating the risk of climate change, but are also incredibly aligned with our, our own mission, which is, again, uh, to prepare the force to defend the country and to fight and win wars if we need to. We need that capability in place. That's one. And then I'll give you another quick one uh, operationally, right? Um, most of our energy in the Department of Defense, two-thirds of our energy, is actually used in operations. So our ships, our tactical vehicles, our airplanes that are out doing their job. Oh, okay, one minute left. I'll be real quick. Um, for the deployed force, um, they rely on a lot of fuel. You've got to deliver that fuel. And in times of crisis, our adversaries want to, want to keep us from getting the fuel we need into theater to support the mission. Um, so what's the, one of the best ways you can mitigate that risk of what we call contested logistics is to not require logistics in the first place. So that means being super efficient in our airplanes, our ships, and our tactical vehicles to not demand as much of the system. And putting in place, again, distributed generation to avert the need for fuel deliveries and mitigate that risk. So in that case, again, clean energy, energy efficiency is not only aligned with our climate imperative, but it's also aligned with our mission imperative. And for the department, uh, that always carries the day. So I will uh, stay under the minute allotment and, uh, and hand over to, hand back to you, Dan, and we can have that conversation, a longer conversation about that when we, uh, when we get to the questions. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. That was great. Uh, our next panelist is Tim Unruh. Tim is executive director of the National Association of Energy Services Companies. Tim, take it away. Well, I don't know if there's anything more to say now, Joe. I think you kind of covered everything. So, so you know, I'm just going to remind people that, you know, with my hat, Margaritaville, 5 o'clock somewhere, <laughs> I hear there might be something happening afterwards, and so I just want to keep that in mind as we head towards that 5 o'clock mark. Uh, that along with my umbrella, which it sounds like we definitely are going to need in order to walk there. But, but you know, Joe, you, you talk about all these things that are needed. Uh, I'm going to talk about maybe some ways you fund those and make those happen. 
Uh, when you think about our federal facilities, there's two really key ways that we can do things. We can get Congress to appropriate us money, and we know that's a piece of cake, right? Easy. It's easy. You just, you just send them an email, and the check arrives usually within a few hours, right? It, it's pretty easy. Um, but in case that doesn't work, we, we have private financing. So private financing is uh, engaging with the private sector to come up with some sort of a methodology that fits within the rules you have to follow and the things that you need in order to get that funding. Um, the, the companies that I represent are energy service companies, and they fit nicely within, within the need for efficiency, need for resiliency, and need for general facility improvements. And so private fin financing in the form of an energy savings performance contract is the type of private financing I'll talk about. Uh, we do about $7 billion of that type of work with public facilities a year, and that's across the whole range of public facilities in the country. And that's about 25% of all the buildings that exist. And when we, when we uh, uh, look at those projects, it gives us the ability to make an improvement on those buildings in uh, using the funding that might have been wasted on efficiency or operations, uh, other things that are happening in the building that aren't necessarily producing the best results. When we do those projects, we can do a lot of things with, with an energy safe performance contract. There's obviously energy efficiency is the most obvious thing, uh, which includes things like weatherization, it can include lighting, it can include building controls. Uh, we do water efficiency. Uh, but yet we also have a big impact on indoor air quality. So as we, as we think about the pandemic and we have a lot of people wearing masks now and people want to have space and they want to have fresh air, uh, efficiency and fresh air in buildings is completely tied together. As you improve efficiency and in install the controls and the systems to control the energy use, you also control the air in the building and you have the ability to provide a cleaner, more, uh, uh, more, more sanitized air that people breathe. A key part that uh, we find in federal facilities and all facilities is operational improvements. So that is, that is a reduction in what it costs to do things. Uh, often what you'll find in facilities is you'll find uh, equipment that is older and requiring additional maintenance and service to get things repaired and keep it operating. And so if you put a new piece of equipment in, you not just have an efficiency improvement, but the operational savings are significant as well, and that you no longer have to keep repairing and replacing parts. But you also may find that you can be more efficient as you do these things. And when it comes to resiliency, we have the ability with resiliency in that efficiency and resiliency are closely tied. Uh, a lot of different things that we do with, with efficiency might have to do with some of the things Joe talked about, the power supply. Uh, we think about uh, serving facilities with additional generation, which might be renewable, it could be other types of generation, or we might have a microgrid in place. Uh, I recall uh, back where I used to work at Department of Energy, we had a project there where we needed to replace the windows, and the windows had a resiliency piece to them that they needed to be blast resistant. So, Efficiency and resiliency, building envelope, protecting the people, all tends to go hand in hand. But one of the things we find is, is that the projects don't always just flow like they, they should. There's a resistance to the projects. And I was trying to think of an example. I, I, thought, I thought, you know, I'm right-handed, and if I brush my teeth, I use my right hand. And if you ever try to use your opposite, non-dominant hand to brush your teeth, you can do it, but it's, it's harder to do, and it's just not as easy to think about it. That's a little bit like doing an energy savings performance contract, is that it's not as obvious and it's not as easy to do. And so we have to incentivize people to do those things. And so leadership, challenges, putting people in charge of uh, having accountability is really important in performance contracts to make sure that we accomplish more than what we are today. So again, resiliency is, is a key piece. And uh, my, my colleague, Jennifer Schaefer, in the back of the room talked about making sure that we look at things fence to fence. Uh, when we do a project, resiliency and efficiency are tied together. So if you want to make something more resilient, you have to make sure that everything is sized right first. And so if you size it right for efficiency, it probably makes the resiliency project less, less, uh, less costly. But one of the key things to remember about a resilient project is sometimes resilient costs more than what efficiency can fund by itself. And so we have to combine some taxpayer money that might cover some resiliency with some private financing to make some project better than what it would have been with two separate pieces alone. And so when we look at the projects, we think about that as leverage. How do we leverage a project and get more use out of our funding? Uh, the program back at Department of Energy used to run the Federal Engine Management Program, used to do that very well with its AFEC program. 
it would, it would take $1 and leverage up to $25, so meaning that each $1 in taxpayer funds could get $25 of installation improvements within our buildings. So as we, look at, as we look at the possibilities, we have to think about how we leverage the funds, how we think about resiliency and efficiency together, and how we look at private financing and to create a way to encourage those and incentivize those across the federal government. Thanks, Tim. And since you mentioned her, Jennifer, uh, it was a great panelist on a ESI briefing a little bit earlier this year about energy efficiency and it meaning business. So if you want to learn more about Jennifer, um, it's a great place to start. Uh, and also, you know, it was a really good briefing. Our third panelist today is Andy Bachman. Uh, Andy is Senior Grid Strategist, National and Homeland Security uh, from Idaho National Lab. Welcome, Andy. Testing three, four, five. Okay, thanks, Stan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to be as extemporaneous as my two uh, predecessors here, but I'll do what I can. Uh, thanks to Chairman Crapo and other co-sponsors. My name is Andy Bachman, and uh, I'm what Dan said I am. Uh, shorthand for it would be I'm a grid defender against both cyber and physical climate risks. Acknowledging the imperative for the United States to move as rapidly as possible from carbon emitting fossil fuels, one can't, one can't help but imagine a grid with very many more wind turbines and solar panels than are currently deployed. Yet even, yet even that won't likely be enough given what University of Colorado professor Roger Pelkey has dubbed the iron law of climate policy, with which it's difficult to argue. It holds that, basically, when policies on emissions reductions collide with policies focused on economic growth economic growth will win out every time. The iron law is a boundary condition on policy design that is every bit as limiting as the second law of thermodynamics, and it holds everywhere around the world, in rich and poor countries alike. Factor in the mainstreaming of electric vehicles and other trends towards electrification, and we're gonna to need to add much more power to the grid in the near and midterm future than renewables alone can provide. There are also some serious grid stability issues to address, like voltage support and other ancillary services, which become much more challenging with high penetration of variable generation sources. So with energy security in mind in a carbon-constrained world, I ask you to consider this five-part business case for coal to nuclear plant conversion. Point number one, as a solution to current reliability crises, See the North American Electric Reliability Corporation's summer reliability assessment for this year. It shows the entire U.S. West at risk and the mid-continent independent system operator, MISO region, as a high risk of summer outages. Basically, they painted the entire West orange, and they painted the stripe down the middle, north to south, uh, red, being much higher risk for outages. We've been closing coal plants without fully accounting for the lost baseload generation they provide. Renewables are necessary and super helpful in reducing emissions, but with few exceptions, they're not ready to play that role, at least not on their own. Gas plants do provide baseload, but must also be phased out. And given the time gap between the potential retirement of coal plants and starting up new nuclear plants, consideration should be given to transmission rights in this transition. Point number two, the rest of them are shorter. For job retention, for job retention, according to advanced reactor developer New Scale, as well as my lab colleagues who are researching this topic, all or most uh, of jobs in a coal plant can convert some directly and some with training to comparable positions in an advanced nuclear plant, and additional positions are possible as well. The grid retains base load power, and the community retains its tax base and more. Point number three. To minimize the need to site, permit, and build new transmission lines, the coal to nuclear strategy fully leverages existing transmission lines and other already existing infrastructure elements. This is hugely important as recent attempts to build new transmission lines in the United States have run into trouble again and again. Number four, this may be a tough sell for some, but overall the public's attitude towards new nuclear energy is improving swiftly as climate concerns begin to eclipse the fears of nuclear energy, and a recent Pew study confirms this. There are still plenty of well-founded objections to overcome, but small modular reactors and other advanced nuclear designs do meaningful address most of them. And lastly, point five, for renewable generation support, 
with a firm dispatchable load following base load in place, renewable deployments much larger than today's can be made with <coughs> excuse me can be made with confidence that the grid can grow to support additional requirements for electricity while remaining as reliable as national and economic security required to be. A good example of this is the Department of Energy's Advanced Reactor Demonstration Project in Wyoming. With its innovative thermal storage system, it will maximize market opportunities and specifically support renewable generation. My colleagues in Idaho and across the National Lab Complex are working with industry partners to optimize new designs, new advanced modular reactors and microreactors, some of which will be built on INL's ground, like the Department of Energy's Marvel Test Reactor and DOD's Pele Microreactor. In addition to the Department of Energy's Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear, or GAIN program, home to INL, is pursuing case studies associated with transitioning coal plants to advanced reactors. GAIN's objectives include the development of a toolkit for coal plant owners and their communities to use when considering nuclear technology as a possible repowering option. We're enthusiastic about options, uh, about the progress being made in Kemmerer, Wyoming, which will likely see the first real-world commercial conversion of a coal plant to modular reactor. This is the last paragraph. Finally, one big advantage of INL's involvement during the design phase of these projects is that the lab's cyber experts are able to leverage Cyber Informed Engineering, or CIE, a Department of Energy national strategy pioneered at INL, and the lab's own Securing the Path to Net Zero initiative. The former helps ensure new reactors are as cyber secure as possible throughout their life cycle, while the latter aims to protect all manner of new systems that will play a part in the transition to a carbon emission-free U.S. electric grid. I thank you for your time and attention. Welcome questions. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. That was a great presentation. Speaking of great presentations, now I'm going to turn to our fourth panelist, Charles Bolden. Charles is Director of Congressional Affairs at the Solar Energy Industries Association. Take it away, Charles. Thank you, Dan. Um, I don't know how I go behind three of these guys, but here I am. Uh, again, my name is Charles Bolden. I'm the Director of Congressional Affairs at the Solar Energy Industries Association. Uh, I'd like to thank EESI for inviting me on this panel. Uh, it seems like just yesterday I was in this room, or a room similar, uh, as a Capitol Hill staffer uh, and, and, and really uh, getting involved into what EESI have, have been putting out. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here today. Uh, SIA is the National Trade Association for the Solar and Solar Plus Storage Industries. Uh, SIA works with over 1,000 member companies to fight for policies that create jobs in every community and shape fair market rules that promote competition and the growth of reliable, low-cost solar power SIA set a target goal of 100 gigawatts of renewable energy manufacturing capacity, including 50 gigawatts of solar manufacturing production by 2030. SIA focuses on promoting domestic manufacturing for renewable energy resources. There are many benefits of growing domestic renewable energy manufacturing. One of the main ones uh, is job creation. And as of 2021, the solar industry employs over 250,000 people. Solar jobs span a variety of fields. An increase in domestic solar production would generate jobs in research and development, manufacturing of solar power materials, construction and operation of solar power plants, and solar power installation and maintenance. We must train workers to thrive in, clean e in, a, in a clean economy and give workers fair opportunities in good paying jobs with benefits like health care and child care. Renewable energy industries create jobs and lower energy costs, which together generate economic development, one of the most important things I hear across Capitol Hill today. With the right investments, the United States could lead the renewable energy field in advanced technologies and innovation. A domestic supply chain would allow us to oversee the supplies for renewables and guarantee that they are produced ethically and sustainably. In order to create a strong domestic supply chain, it will require long-term federal investments and a suite of policy options that designed to incentivize investments in manufacturing capacity. They would need support for ongoing factory production. The industry also needs demand certainty. All three investments are essential to promoting domestic manufacturing. SIA values diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice within our organization and the promotion of these values across the solar industry. As the National Trade Association on solar, we encourage solutions to maximize access 
to solar energy for all families and communities, regardless of zip code, income level, or any other factor. Many low and moderate income communities are missing out on the benefits of solar plus storage technologies. These benefits can include cost savings, resilience against natural disasters, health improvements, and more. Intentional and thoughtful action on the part of policymakers and private industry is necessary to expand solar and its benefits to all Americans. As an industry that deploys clean, reliable, affordable electricity, SIA recognizes the critical role for environmental justice in the energy transition and, they, and the need for climate solutions to consider the disproportionate impacts felt by frontline communities. The Build Back Better Act, what a, what a, what a, what a bill. Uh, the bill includes $162.9 billion to advance environmental justice priorities. The environmental and climate justice block grants provide funding to reduce pollution and climate threats in communities on the front lines of our nation's most dangerous legacy environmental and health hazards. There are many other environmental justice provisions in the Build Back Better Act that we will support underprivileged, that will support underprivileged communities and boost the economy. While we know that it's not likely that all of these provisions will be adopted this year or this Congress, it is still significant that environmental justice remains such an important priority for Congress. SEAL will continue to try to advance these priorities. The clean energy economy must be centered around justice and equity for all Americans, support communities, and have historically been left, that have historically been left behind by environmental policies. But we can only achieve this just an equitable transition through intentional advocacy that prioritizes environmental justice and creates regenerative, sustainable economic wealth in local communities. Thank you all again, and I look forward to the panel discussions. Thanks, Charles. I look forward to the discussion as well. And to kick off our discussion, I think maybe, Joe, we'll start with you and we'll go through the panel. I'd like to um, ask our panelists to kind of bring things back to the infrastructure bill. So Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. It was a bigger theme on some of our earlier panels, but my guess is that there are investments provided by Congress and the IJA that would boost energy sector resilience, energy sector security. So, Joe, I'll start with you, and then we'll go through and we'll hear from Tim and, and Andy and Charles. Sure. Thanks, Dan. Um, so, uh, not funding, obviously, for, for DOD directly in the bill, but there's some really important funding that, um, that kind of relates to the challenge that we I described earlier. Uh, I mean... The investments that the bill makes in, in, um, in transmission and in uh, overall grid resilience, really important uh, broadly across the country, but also important for our installations. So massive investments there. I think it's an exceptionally important bill. Uh, we've needed transmission investment for a really long time. I think it, it, um, it opens the door for us to think about uh, combining renewables to create um, baseload or baseload equivalent generation, which is really important if you can get uh, regional uh, regional connections there, and we saw some of the challenges. We've seen some of the challenges of not having those connections over the past couple of years. That's one area that I think is quite important. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of money in there for demonstration projects, and we're especially interested in things like long-term energy storage, which for a, a military installation that might have to keep operations up and running in a contingency um, for a long period of time. I mean, long-duration energy storage, whether it's you know flow batteries or whatever, uh, we're looking at beyond lithium-ion or even some lithium-ion uh, applications. Really important for for us as we think about we're you know we're big we're big energy demanders on the on the grid and and, and um, uh, it's it's manageable to put in place the kind of storage you need to to get through a to get through a short duration outage but long duration storage is going to be important both for maintaining our mission but also for the long term um, growth in renewables industries like like solar and then one other area that I think is um, it's not. Um, it's not obvious that the Department of Defense would be interested in, but we have a fundamental interest in the supply chain investments that are in the uh, that are in the bill. If you look at uh, batteries, for instance, um, you know the United States is in a very challenging position uh, on our battery supply chain, uh, particularly upstream as you move into process minerals and anode cathode manufacture. We're just not in a competitive position, and we need to get there. I think this administration has done an excellent job coming in and saying, "Hey, we need to catch up because we're behind," and I think that that's. That's what we need to do. Um, it's obviously important for the electric vehicle industry, but what's not commonly known is the Department of Defense relies on lithium-ion batteries for a range of applications from handheld radios to, uh, uh, to submersibles to UAVs, lots of lithium-ion applications in the Department of Defense, future capabilities from, you know, from things like directed energy weapons to uh, anything we want to deploy on a ship, uh, lasers. 
Um, all of that relies on lithium ion batteries, and, and, and we need uh, a secure supply chain. And the fact is, right now, our supply chain leaves our, leaves our acquisitions and leaves the system of the Department of Defense and goes straight to Asia. We've seen the risk around COVID associated with having uh, extended supply chains, and some of which are maybe controlled by folks who don't always have your best interests at heart. So we need that supply chain investment um, that the, the infrastructure bill uh, puts in place. For lots of reasons, it's not always obvious that the Department of Defense will be the beneficiary of that kind of investment, but it's, it is really critical to our, uh, to our military capability and our ability to do our job um, uh, in, in, at times when we won't want maybe somebody else putting their thumb on the scales of, uh, of the supply chain. So all of those are, are, are a range of other things we can talk about. But That's great. Tim? Again, I always have to follow Joe. He does such a great job. It you look bad, Joe. We'll mix up the order for the next question, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, for for the... He want, he... My light doesn't come on very well. There we go. It's called Affect, and uh, that was funded with uh, two hundred and fifty million dollars. Now, now, our goal with that is to is to see that combined with private sector funding. Now, we may not always see the twenty five multiplier, which are some of the maximums we've seen, but it's realistic to think that we might see a ten times multiplier on that money, and that would mean that two hundred and fifty million dollars could easily equate to two point five billion dollars of facility improvements. Uh, depending on how well the, the uh, leveraging goes, we could even see more. And so that kind of money can come in and provide a lot of different benefits for the facilities. That can provide microgrid support, which can improve resiliency. That can provide um, alternative sources, that di different generation support sources that we can put in, from renewable to potentially even one of your nuclear uh, reactors uh, to other types of generation. So it has a lot of opportunity to improve the buildings. The, uh, the IIJ also has funding for non-federal facilities as well. It has uh, $500 million to improve K-12 school funding, and it specifically tells us that we have to leverage that money with private sector money to make it go further. Uh, so we hope to see that leverage by a factor of maybe three to five out in the, the uh, K-12 schools. And there's also the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grants, which received $550 million. All of those types of funding will help improve those buildings' operation. When we think about buildings, it's important for us to remember that, that the buildings play an outsized role. When we think about what happened when COVID struck, we had places that we were using buildings differently than what we used before. We had high schools being used as vaccination sites, potentially uh, hospitals that were being used to house patients that we didn't, never thought of in, in the volumes we had thought. And so one of the things that we do, can do with this money is we can adapt the buildings to be more flexible. As you put in different types of HVAC systems, heating, cooling, ventilation systems, and you change the building's construction, you can actually make a building that's more resilient. And resiliency means improving the facility's resiliency, but also the community resiliency and how they use those buildings. Federal buildings are the same way, that they're being used in different ways than we thought before. I know when I talk to the people at GSA, their building structures are completely changed. They have to come up with a different way of housing the people because so many people are working at home and different rotation schedules. So as we think about our buildings, transformation of those buildings is going to be needed, and that funding through IIJ will provide a key avenue. And what's important that we do that is we transform these buildings, that we do it in an efficient fashion. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Andy, curious what you would like to highlight in the infrastructure bill. Testing again. Okay, sorry about that. It's just interesting. Uh, I appreciate that. If I need it, right? Resilience. Um, some of what Joe was saying was making me think, it was reminding me of uh, back in 2008, there was a Defense Science Board report on energy, um, more tooth, less tail, I believe. And um, we were talking about um, energy metrics so that we could actually manage what we measure, right? There was a thing called the fully burdened cost of fuel and the energy efficiency KPI, we were all advocating to try to get more of that into the, into the process. And I would argue that would be something like that trying to bring that back from the past, ways of measuring some of the performance and uh, benefits that we're getting out of IAJA expenditures, I think would be a great idea. I think my comment on the bill is, is short. Um, first of all, is the National Climate Adaptation and Resilience Strategy Act still in motion, or is that, uh, is that not in play? Um, NCARS, no. It's, NCAR. I mean, it's, it's, I think, 
I mean, it certainly has bipartisan support, I think, in the House and the Senate. Um, so it's something that we're following. I, I don't think it's passed either chamber, though. Okay. Well, to the extent I understand it, it's, it seems like it could form a focusing function uh, to make sure that some of the key uh, climate adaptation and resilience targets that we need to hit are actually um, aimed for, at least in IAJA. One summary point would just be, and that we've seen evidence of this uh, as recently as last week in the UK and in uh, France and in Spain, is to make sure that when we build new infrastructure, that we design it for the century that we're in and not for the previous century. We saw cloud service providers and nuclear energy plants have to turn off because it was too hot. And so when you really needed the, the, the nuke plant in this case, but it's not limited to nuclear power, you couldn't have it. You couldn't have it for air conditioning. And it's because it wasn't designed for the world that we're in right, right now. It's similar with the data centers, which are really important. If things are designed for a different temperature regime than the one we've landed at in 2022, and imagine what is likely to be our world in 2025 or 2030, we want to make sure that these new expenditures, new designs, uh, have that baked in. And we don't keep doing the thing where we have to bolt it on afterwards, like cybersecurity. Same thing, I guess, for cybersecurity. These things are being built in a cyber contested world uh, to the extent that they are digital and rely on digital technologies. We want to make sure that's baked into them, too. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. And Charles, I'm curious what, from, from the solar industry's perspective, what you'd like to highlight uh, that was provided in the IIJA? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, and going behind these gentlemen who have said everything, uh, I guess I, one of the biggest things is that um, the $65 billion uh, investment, which was the largest in the United States history, I think that that was something that we were very encouraged to see. Um, and, and that's on grid resiliency and transmission. Um, those are things that we have identified uh, at the Solar Energy Industries Association that are very important because uh, the, the climate crisis that we see across the nation, whether it's in uh, the West Coast with the extreme fires and they're damaging the transmission lines, we know that those funds will be able to, one, extend and, and, and improve existing transmission lines, um, but also create new transmission lines. Uh, another point um, would be on the transportation aspect when we see uh, EVs, and we're, we're very supportive, but we also understand that there is going to come a time where we can put solar, pa solar panels to, uh, to charge EVs um, and battery storage as well. So those are some of the key Im important uh, uh, policies that were in the, in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Great, thanks. And I promised Tim that we would mix up the order. So Tim, as reward, I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, and then we'll give, uh, we'll give Joe the last word on this question. Um, I'm curious, and, and similar question that we've asked to some of our other panels, and that is to help us, you know, we have 2030 goals, we're thinking about sort of this as the critical decade. Um, and, and Charles was just talking about transportation, for example, but, you know, there's a lot happening in the grid. There's a lot of transformation happening in the transportation sector, the building sector. We obviously are still in a pandemic, or at least, you know, towards the transition from pandemic to endemic. Um, and we have a lot of uns we have a lot of unsettled geopolitics. I'm curious, given all of the different things that we have to do and given where we sort of see ourselves, to Andy's point, preparing ourselves for where we're going, not where we've been, what's your vision for energy sector resilience? What's your vision for energy security in 2030? And specifically, as you're thinking about that, sort of what do we need to do to make progress? Like, where do we have the most catching up to do from your perspective? And Tim, we'll start with you, lucky you, and then we'll go through the line. You're just being mean. That was a hard question. Well, you were complaining about my moderating, so. <laughs> I was just praising Joe. <laughs> so when, when I look at the, the overall energy industry, I, I think that we're, we are in a transition, and we are seeing transitions happen all across. Uh, on the, the grid side, we're seeing all of our sources start to have uh, some sort of a rectifier between them, the generation and the grid. On the load side, uh, we're pretty much already there. We have all of our load have, have some sort of a rectifier between the two. And so I think what we see the potential happening in the grid is that we see a more dynamic grid that's going to be changing and altering much faster. And where does efficiency and all of that fun stuff come into play? Um, I, I believe that efficiency offers an opportunity to have more micro control of some of the way the grid uses power. And uh, that allows us to provide a balancing act, per se, 
to the way that power is being generated. Now, now today we, we really still have a fairly small amount of renewable power on the grid. And so uh, it, it's not making a big issue, but as it grows, we'll see more renewable power and more need for the load to be flexible. Where the load can be flexible is often by implementing efficiency projects. W when we think about buildings, uh, I think you, you talked about making sure that we build things for today as opposed to, to the past. Uh, buildings are the same way. We are, we're operating buildings with equipment that is extremely old and is extremely outdated compared to what we have today. When an energy efficiency project is done, we transform the building from technology that might be 50 years old to technology that is brand new and has the ability to be controlled dynamically through control systems, through building management systems that can do significant amount of adjustment to the way that building uses energy. And we're still figuring out new ways we can do those adjustments and new ways to, to handle those adjustments. Uh, so, so I guess when we, when we see the, the ability of buildings to be able to provide that load resource to the grid, I think that we have to think of the efficiency project comes in and doesn't just make a building more efficient, more operationally efficient, but it also makes it more of a smart building, uh, something that's more future-proof. So um, as we think about doing efficiency projects, we have to think beyond just making them use less energy or making the operations uh, different. We're actually talking about building an asset that will help our grid transform to where we want to see it in 2030 and, and beyond. And um, when we think about those vehicles that are going to be charged, many times those are connected to some sort of a building. Uh, yes, there are charging stations out in the middle of parking lots that are directly connected to the grid, but there's many more charging stations that are in garages, that are in public garages, that are in people's personal garages, that are in business parking lots that are connected to the building. And so those also become a dynamic resource. Uh, when you think about the private sector's piece of that, because I have to bring the private sector in also. The private sector really offers the ability to come in and do a project, implement these specific control measures in a building, bring the building up to more modern grid capability, but then at the same time providing the service to manage and coordinate that with the local utility because that is a significant function as well. And uh, finally, you asked uh, what do we need in the future? Um, I think we need cooperation and communication protocols to make this all happen. Thanks for that. Um, Andy, what's your vision for energy sector resilience in 2030 from where you're sitting? Okay, yeah, blame the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Operator error, he's suggesting. Um, first of all, Dan, I wanted to say that your term, uh, unsettled geopolitics, is a tremendous understatement. <laughs> Global unsettled geopolitics. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Um, we are in a thing that uh, many practitioners will refer to this epoch or this period as the energy transition. And so much is captured in that statement. The retirement of older things, uh, fossil fuel burning things, notably the bringing on of variable generation, solar wind, storage on top of hydro, etc. Uh, sometimes people will say, it's not that big a deal, it's just like walking and chewing gum. You can do that, right? I say, yeah, no, it's, it's more like juggling 10,000 flaming swords all at the same time for the operators and for the managers at the ISOs and the RTOs. It's super complex stuff with many competing values. And you see that playing out when that NERC report that I referenced in the beginning that shows big parts of the country being at higher risk this summer of blackouts and brownouts. Um, on top of the Texas uh, freeze, the deep freeze of last February, I mean, it seems to me unacceptable that perhaps the most important uh, critical, the most critical of all critical infrastructures is something we play this fast and loose with, where we have to worry whether it's going to make it through the summer, for example, where we are. This is something we should manage in really the most conservative way possible while we're modernizing it, making sure that below the level of flux and change that we're introducing to it, for very many good reasons, that we've really made sure this thing is super solid, reliable, dependent, as it needs to be. So that's my uh, case for doing these things, but doing it in a conservative way so that we're not always worrying that the grid is going to fall out from under us. Thanks for that. Charles, what's the solar industry's vision for energy security uh, and, um, in 2030? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, in short, controlling the supply chain, um, I think bringing back, uh, bringing domestic manufacturing uh, to the United States will not only improve our resiliency, but also improve uh, the economy. 
Um, uh, uh, in short, you know, uh, the vision that I have is solar plants everywhere, obviously, um, but, but um, you know, domestic manufacturing and, 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 and controlling the supply chain. Thanks. I think you're allowed to have a vision for solar everywhere coming from at SIA. That's totally fine. <laughs> um, Joe, I'll give you the last word on the panel. Or what, what's the administration's vision? What's DOD's vision? What's your vision for energy security in 2030? Um, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll go short on vision and just real quick on, on facts, just to ground us in some of the things Andy talked about. Uh, 95, correct me if I'm wrong on this. 95% of power capacity additions globally over the next decade are going to be, over the next five years, in fact, are going to be renewables, it's going to be solar or wind. Um, in the past year, China has installed more offshore wind capacity than the rest of the world has in the past five years combined. Um, the entire transport global transportation system is going electric, fast. GM's all electric by 2035, Ford 50% by 2030. Every major manufacturer in the world is, is going electric and made very explicit commitments. Those commitments backed up by very serious investments. I think Ford made a, um, the largest investment in company history a few months ago with $11 billion in Tennessee and Kentucky for battery plants. We are in the middle of a massive uh, global transformation that those of us who work in this business, and many of you, uh, see very clearly. I think the challenge for us as a country is to understand and acknowledge that's happening and reach consensus that the United States has to lead that transition. Um, and I think we're, we, we struggle with that. And what I would posit is that I care about this a lot because of climate and for other reasons, but you don't even have to care about climate change to think that the United States has an imperative to lead. We have a manufacturing uh, competition globally that depends on us leading in these key industries. We have a national security imperative in which we have capability that rely on these technologies to keep us at the cutting edge in terms of technology and to keep us competitive with our adversaries and global competitors. So mm -hmm. I think that what's necessary is that we understand that it doesn't matter how you reach the conclusion that we must lead this. I, I get there because I think climate is the uh, defining uh, condition of our time. Um, but you don't have to agree with me to think we ought to get there. And so that's, I think, the kind of mm -hmm. message that this body can carry into the Congress is that we, we don't have to all focus on the reasons why we might disagree because I think the end state is one that we all agree on. And I think that if we acknowledge what's happening and changing globally, uh, we can we can reach some policy consensus around that. I know that's hard, but I I do think that that's that's the vision of success, uh, and I think it's on us to to, to get there. So uh, without without getting into a vision of like anything else, that's what I'll leave with. It's a pretty good place to end. Thank you so much, Joe and Tim and Andy and Charles for four excellent pre uh, presentations today. Um, we are at the end of our fourth panel at the 2022 uh, Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum. My colleague just put a slide up. Uh, for those in the online audience, you should be able to see this as well. There's a link uh, to a survey. If you have a moment to take the survey, we read every response. It means a lot. Uh, if you had any audio issues, video issues, if you were in the room and you had an issue, if you have ideas for future events or other feedback, like I said, we read every response. So we really appreciate that. Um, I would like to once again thank uh, these four panelists, but also the other 12 panelists that we had over our previous three panels. Um, we couldn't really do what we do at ESI without, um, you know, the, the cooperation and collaboration from folks around the, the clean energy and the climate and environmental sector. So thank you all, uh, everyone who participated in the policy forum today as a panelist. Thank you so much. I'd like to thanks to our audience. We had a ton of staff coming in and out of the room today. It's great to be back. Uh, I'm looking forward to the, the next in-person sessions we'll be able to have. We also had hundreds of people watching this online today. And so thanks to everyone in our online audience for joining us as well. Um, I would like to thank, once again, Senators Reed, Crapo, Van Hollens, and Collins, and Representative Kind for their leadership in helping us bring uh, the session here to Capitol Hill today. Thanks to their great staff. Uh, as always, they just do a ton of work uh, to make this possible, and they're great fun to work with. Uh, and then, uh, last but definitely not least, thanks to Team ESI. It's a lot of work pulling these off. 
uh, thanks to uh, everyone on our communications and our policy team and across the organization, including our summer interns. This is their first policy forum. Uh, and Christina was even here with us in person today, so thanks, special thanks to her. Um, we have a lot of stuff coming up. Um, August is a quiet month briefings-wise, but we have some really great stuff coming out with the Farm Bill, which will be the next thing that we're all talking about. Um, we also have a really, I was going to say aggressive, but that's not the right word. We have a, a really um, ambitious congressional education set of programming around COP27 uh, that will take place in October and November. So uh, if you want to know from a congressional perspective what's happening in Sharm El Sheikh, we're the best place to go for that. You can visit us online at www.esi.org. Um, we also just concluded two briefing series covering a lot of the issues we talked about today. Living with climate change, uh, we talked about extreme heat, sea level rise, uh, wildfires. We also had scaling up innovation to drive down emission where we talked about EV charging infrastructure build out and green hydrogen and offshore wind and other topics. So uh, go back and if you, have, if you missed any of those briefings, uh, well, it's okay because you can go watch the live cast and read the summary notes and review the presentation materials and it's all available on our website. We'll go ahead and wrap there. Thank you so much for everyone uh, making our policy forum a big success and uh, I look forward to working with everyone going forward. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks.